Welcome to Scary Stories in Ambient Rain, Volume 7. This is a compilation of stories, created specifically for people who enjoy relaxing and sleeping to my videos. Of course, as always, there are minimal ads. Only three mid-roll ads in this video. There's one after story number one, one after story number two, and one more after story number three. That's it. The rest of the video will be ad-free, so you can properly relax or sleep. If you want to show your support to this channel, please subscribe, hit the thumbs up, and share the video on Facebook and anywhere else you would like. Have a great night. Now, let's begin. I recently started school again, and as a part of my daily routine, I am required to travel to Toronto, Monday through Friday, via the train and subway lines. It's a good two hours one way, so I usually pull out a good book, pop in my headphones, and relax to some music. I of course, being from out of town, have heard a lot of horror stories that many people have endured on the subway. Naturally, I thought most of it was just exaggerations and tall tales. Well. I was very quickly proven dead wrong. About a week ago, I had just finished a very long and grueling day of school, and I wanted nothing more than to just get home and relax as soon as possible. I took my usual bus route to the subway station and sat down on one of the seats directly beside one of the exit doors. Now, a little context. I am facing forward, looking at one seat ahead of me, across the aisle of the subway car. This seat was occupied by a woman that looked to be in her 20s. She was what looked like playing a game on her phone and was paying absolutely no attention to anything going on around her. Next to this seat opposite me is another seat that faces this lady on her phone and it is this person in this seat that made my 40 minute subway ride very disturbing. Occupying this seat was another lady that looked to be about 40 years old and possessed a very creepy smile. I say this because she never stopped smiling. And I mean, she was smiling the entire subway ride. For the first half of the ride, she was staring at the younger lady on her phone, laughing and muttering to herself. She also would occasionally take her phone out of her purse and take pictures of the girl on her phone about halfway to my destination, the younger girl that was on her phone left the subway car, and the smiling lady's attention was then directed at me. She turned to face me and gave me a huge, disturbing, toothy grin. I just stared at a poster on the roof of the train for what felt like hours. Eventually she got the hint that I was avoiding her gaze like the plague and went to plan B. She opened up her purse and removed a tube of toothpaste. She then proceeded to ingest at least half the tube. I damn near threw up, but somehow held it together, even though while she did this, she was still smiling at me, while laughing, now her face covered in toothpaste. My stop finally came and I bolted from that subway car as fast as I could. I got to the escalator and glanced back to the car, and guess who I see walking fast towards me, arms held still at her side, still smiling. I was understandably completely terrified at this point. I ran out of the station into the bus. I made it onto the bus just as it pulled away from the station. I took one final look back, and there she was, standing on the platform, head cocked to the side, laughing and waving goodbye to me. Around two years ago, I finally moved into a brand new house in a brand new building estate in Australia. I was one of the first to have finished a build in the area and was elated to finally gain independence. 
The first few weeks went by as normal, and during that time, I would often take walks alone with my dog in the afternoons and roam the surrounding estate area. All the roads around us had been partially completed, and all the other properties were marked out, but no other houses were built, excluding the one that was directly opposite mine. The house looked finished, but there was no driveway laid yet, and from what I could gather, no one lived there. To the left of my house, roughly a few hundred meters away, was a field with a huge hill in it. I later found out that the whole area was council property. Not only was no one allowed to build up there, but the whole hill was basically a no-go zone. For whatever reason, the council just didn't want people on it, so the whole area was surrounded by a huge chain-link fence. The only other noticeable feature in the area was a small abandoned farmhouse with a shed a few kilometers down the road. I knew nothing about it and often went walking there with the dog as it gave me something mild to explore amongst the vast nothingness I was living around. The entire place was dilapidated and completely inhabitable, but it was still interesting nonetheless. About a month or two after moving in, I awoke one morning to the sound of a violin. It sounded extremely distant and quite haunting. I actually enjoyed it and assumed that the neighbors opposite me had finally moved in. Excited that I finally had some people to talk to, I peeked out the curtain and saw the house opposite mine was still as vacant as it ever was. I got dressed, but by the time I managed to look outside, the violin had stopped. This happened roughly every second day of the next week. The violin would wake me up and then just disappear after about 45 seconds. I would ignore it to the point where my curiosity simply got the better of me, and the next morning when I heard the violin playing again, I immediately jumped out of bed and shot out the front door. I scoured the early morning surrounding, and there, up on the hill, was a figure playing a violin. It was barely light, but the person looked very tall from the distance I was at and as they were playing, they were doing what could only be described as a waltz-type walk, spinning slowly around in a circle as they played. I took my eyes off the person and walked over to pick up the morning paper, and in the ten seconds that took me, I heard the violin stop. When I looked up, I noticed the figure was no longer playing or dancing, but was now standing still and most likely looking in my direction. It was so dark, I couldn't see them clearly, and we both just stood there for half a minute, not moving, before the creeps got the better of me, and I went back inside. After that morning, things started happening. On my walks, I began to notice footprints on the surrounding properties that weren't made by me, and that I had never seen before which I just assumed were from people walking up from the other housing areas down the road. I never awoke to the violin, but I swore I could hear someone walking on the street next to my bedroom window in the early mornings. However, I never saw anything. Other really general things as well, like random tools such as spades and rakes laying around the area, which I guessed were left there by construction crews none of which I ever saw. I would start getting calls at work that would immediately hang up on me, and I also stopped walking up to the abandoned farmhouse, as the experience with the violin player had me a little shaken. One night, as I was heading to bed, I turned off the television in the living room, and again, could hear the faint sound of a violin playing. However, it sounded more muffled and rehearsed, I froze, and a cold chill flowed through me instantaneously, considering that it was about midnight and not the usual time I would hear it playing. I went to the front window and peeked out to see that there was a light in the house opposite mine. It was clearly a candle, as I could see the dim light flicker in the empty window 
and the music sounded like it was coming from an old record player. But in the ten minutes I watched, I never saw any movement inside the house. I moved away from the window sufficiently freaked out, and after another five minutes, I heard the music abruptly stop. I peeked out again to notice the light was now out. I never saw anyone. I began to become unsettled in the house, and would often invite friends over to hang out, until late. But of course, nothing would ever happen when someone else was with me. I never bothered to tell any of my friends, as without evidence, I figured they would just not believe me, and I would just become more agitated. But nothing compared to what happened next. In my living area, the desk sits right next to a small window, which looks out to the fence surrounding my property. The steel fence is literally an arm's length from my house, and about six feet tall, so I always figured that unlike most of the other windows, I would never need to cover this one with a sheet or blanket because no one could ever see in. I usually had headphones on when I played, and I always had the lights off, for no other reason than I preferred to play games in the dark. One night when I was gaming, I got up and walked into the dark kitchen to get a beer out of the fridge. It was dead silent, excluding the faint sound coming out of my headphones. As I closed the fridge and turned around to face the desk, I saw directly out the window two very, very faint lights. I didn't even catch on and immediately started walking back to the desk, fixated on the small glowing balls, and it wasn't until I had my nose almost pressed against the glass that I realized the two lights weren't lights at all. They were eyes. A set of eyes, sitting above the fence line, staring wide open at me. They didn't blink. They didn't move. My entire body locked up. All I could do was simply stare back, as my brain was still comprehending that there was an actual person looking at me in the scariest way I could possibly ever imagine. I don't know what happened. Either my head kicked into gear, or my muscles loosened, but my body automatically collapsed, and I fell to the floor, scurrying to hide against the wall, away from the window. I could hear my heart beating through the carpet like a drum as I tried to lay as flat as possible, and as my mind was still processing the sheer severity of the situation. A violin started playing. That violin, and the haunting tune it always emitted, started up. Except this time, it was directly outside my window, and much louder than I had ever heard it before. The lights were still off, and I wanted to get up to turn off the PC screen so I couldn't be seen, but my whole body just wasn't ready to cooperate. Not only was the sound of the instrument extraordinarily loud, but it sounded like it was being played with frustration, notes being missed frequently, and the strings screeching. The pace of it was getting faster and faster, and by this time, my dog Jeb, out in the backyard, had picked up on the situation, and registering an unfamiliar sound, gave one solitary deep bark. The violin instantly stopped, and the house was finally dead silent, excluding my headphones, which I could hear quietly working away. I was still frozen to the carpet, and it wasn't until Jeb gave a second menacing bark that I heard the figure outside the window start to walk away, in the direction of my yard. Once that first footstep hit the ground, I instantly thought of the welfare of my best friend, and finally, my head connected with my extremities, and my entire body kicked into overdrive. I left from the ground and slid across the laminated floor to the back door, where Jeb was standing, staring into the backyard. I ducked to keep low, and quietly unlocked and slid open the door. Usually, doing so would notify Jeb that he was allowed inside, but when the door opened up, he didn't move an inch, and was completely fixated on the pitch-black backyard. Everything told me not to go outside, 
but there was no chance I was letting anything happen to my dog, and I moved out onto the alfresco, moved behind Jeb, put my hand under his collar, and attempted to back him toward the house. Jeb is a pure Labrador, and weighs like a sack of sand, so when he doesn't want to move, it takes a sheer force to pull him in the direction you want him to go. And right now, Jeb wasn't going anywhere. I yanked at his scruff, and as I did, he emitted a bark like I had never heard before. A deep, bellowing sound that elevated my nerves to an all-time high. We both just stood there, waiting for some form of reply, and I couldn't remember how long we both just froze there. But eventually, I heard footsteps from around the side of the house begin to walk away. But not a simple walk. Almost like whoever was doing it was slowly dancing in a circle, the footsteps keeping to a beat as they drifted away from the house into the distance. Once I couldn't hear anything, Jeb licked his lips, gave me a look, and wandered back inside. I followed, locked the door behind me, and spent the night reverting to my childlike self, hiding under my bed covers with my dog. I didn't sleep a wink. That was the last time I ever saw or heard the violin player. The following morning when the sun finally came up, I called into work sick and then called the police. They scoured the lot next to mine and found footprints in the dirt. However, there were so many there that it was impossible to tell whose were whose. The only description I could give to the officer was his height. He would have had to be over six feet to stare over that fence at me, but they explained that he could have been standing on something, or on his toes. They also told me that they've never received a report of anyone playing a violin in the area, or of anyone being in the fenced off hill either. I essentially looked like an insane person, but the officers were very nice about the whole thing, and offered to patrol the area for the next few nights which helped put my mind at ease. Nothing else has happened since then. Over the next year or two, people finally started moving in, and I tell them all the story about the figure I saw, some of which still use to keep their children in line, which I found funny. One guy nicknamed the council lot, Violin Hill, and the name has stuck around our street since then. I'm still in this house, I still tell people the story, and I haven't changed my routine one bit, which has really helped me to block out the fear of the experience. Although one thing has changed. I game with the blinds closed now. This happened when I was about 13 or 14. When I was a young teenager, back in the fall of 2006, me, my family, and my neighbors started having bizarre encounters with an old man in a dark red minivan. Back then, I used to live on a hill above an old non-operational fishing village. It was about a 40 minute drive outside of the city, along a highway. The highway to the village was a dead end. There was nothing down that way, except housing. There wasn't even motels or any stores. Most of the houses were homes to elderly people, while the others were abandoned fishing stages that overlooked the water. It was very strange to see anyone that we didn't recognize down in that area, especially from September until May. We would get the odd tourist during the summer months, but never from fall to spring. When I was in middle school, Every day after I got home off the bus, I would walk up to the mailbox. It was about a good 15 minute walk along the highway. The mailbox was up the road towards the city. Past my house, there was only about eight other houses, all on the same side of the road as mine. After those houses, it was just thick trees and marshes. I used to like to call the area Silentville instead of Silent Hill. We were right on the very edge of the east coast, right by the ocean. 
It was a fog bank all year round. It was rare that we would get sunny days. Even when it was sunny in the city, it was still foggy down there. Sometimes the fog was so thick, you could barely see a few feet ahead of you. One afternoon after school, while I was on my usual trek back to home after checking the mailbox, I heard the rattling of a vehicle in the distance. I always walked facing traffic, since my mother would have a fit if I didn't. It was crawling towards me, its headlights clearing the fog. It was probably going about 5 miles per hour, which was odd, considering the speed limit was about 70. The minivan came to a halt, about 10 feet ahead of me. It just stopped, right in the middle of the highway. I continued towards it. I figured it was someone looking for directions. As I neared the window of the car, I could see an old man sitting in the driver's seat. He was of a fairly small build, with light gray patches of hair on his head. His eyes were very watery and of dark blue color. Hello, young lady, he said in a very soft voice. Hi, I responded. He started making small talk with me. I really can't remember what, but it was just sort of casual talking. Something I found odd was that he kept one of his hands wedged between the two seats. I could sort of make out what seemed to be something of a metallic material under his hand. After chatting with me a bit, he slowly turned his head away and then continued up the road towards the city. I shrugged it off, just figuring that he was a relative of someone down in the village, and continued home. About a week went by without seeing him, and by then, he was just a memory. I was on my way up to the mailbox when I heard the familiar sound of rattling coming down the roads toward me. Him again? I thought. I was a little weirded out by him, so I jumped down into the ditch and hid in the brush. I watched as he sluggishly drove by. The entire time, he was looking around, observing, sort of like a hunter looking for prey. After he was long out of sight and I couldn't hear his vehicle anymore, I jumped up from the ditch and hurried my way up to the mailbox. The last six minute stretch of road had no housing so it was pretty isolated. After snatching up the mail, I started hurrying back, and that's when I ran into him again, in the worst place possible, the long stretch with no houses. This time, he was coming up the road quite fast. I didn't have time to hide. He pulled up next to me and said, Hello, dearie. Why were you down in the ditch earlier? Oh, crap, I thought. He had seen me. Oh, I thought I had seen a cat down there, I said. You like cute animals, dearie? You can get in the back seat and play with my puppy. She loves kids, he said, smiling. Uh, no thanks, I said, as I started to walk away. He reached out of his window and grabbed my arm. Please, dearie, I insist. I can drive you home. You live there, right? And then pointed at my house. I stood there dumbfounded. How did he know which house I lived in? I shook him off and started to run. He started backing his car up after me, and I bolted to my house and didn't look back. At the time, my aunt lived a few houses up the road from my house, so I decided to run to her driveway and started frantically banging on her door. She came to the door to let me in. I used her phone and called my mother to come pick me up. After we got home, I told her everything. She was very upset and called the police. They basically told us that they couldn't do anything, especially since we didn't have a license plate number. After that, I wasn't allowed to go on walks. He continued to show up, usually twice a week, right after my school bus dropped me off and he would come driving slowly down the road. One day my neighbor asked him what he was doing, and he responded, Oh, I'm just a lonely gentleman. I saw a woman one day down the road, working on her garden, and she just captured my heart. My neighbor told him that she was married, 
he just laughed and said something along the lines of, If you want love to work, you have to work for it. And then drove off. My neighbor got the license plate and called the police. About 40 minutes later the police came down, but he was long gone by then. Our neighbor waved the police over and talked to them. They told him the car had been reported stolen a few months back. Sometime during November, my parents were out in the evening doing yard work. He stopped in front of our yard and was asking my parents where I was. He said that he missed our time together and that he felt neglected. My parents got very upset and chased him away. A few days later, I was up late playing Final Fantasy in the den. The den was on the bottom floor. I used to keep all the blinds open with the lights off in the room. I liked looking at the night sky. People could probably see me through the window, since it was facing the street. So there I was, illuminated by the TV, all cuddled up in my big armchair, having a late night gaming session, probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I see the familiar red minivan slowly coming down the road. I froze. It parked a few feet up the road from my property, in between our house and the house next door. There was a small driveway that led to nowhere, going in between our land. He stopped his car, turned it off, and then came out. I watched in horror as he walked closer to our house. I was terrified. I pushed myself as far back into the chair as I could, hoping he wouldn't see me. I felt like screaming, but my parents were upstairs, and both were sound sleepers. He paced back and forth in front of our house, sort of staring. He was looking into the den. Now, this is the extremely strange part. He just stopped in place, and then laid down on the side of the road, in front of our house. He just lay there for a good hour. I was frozen with fear the entire time. After about an hour, he got up, and then strolled back to his car, and left. I ran upstairs crying and told my parents. They called the police again, but he was gone by the time they got to us. We were all frustrated. The police, despite having his license plate, couldn't do anything, and this guy was coming around, harassing and terrifying us and our neighbors. This went on until about March. About a month passed without seeing him, and that is when we got the news. Our neighbor, who was good friends with someone that lived down a dead-end road, up a bit further, had been on a walk to his friend's house. He spotted the red minivan off in a driveway of a house that had just been put up for sale. The people were moved out. He got filled with anger when seeing it and ran over. When he got closer, he noticed blood on the passenger side window. He then went to the closest house and used their phone to call 911. He went back over to the car to check it out. He was pretty ballsy. He was sort of the neighborhood protector. The car doors were unlocked. He looked in the window to see a wallet, which had an ID in it, and a bloody wrench that was wedged between the two seats. He left and waited for the police to arrive. Our neighbor stayed in contact with the police. Apparently, the guy had left in a hurry, leaving his ID behind. Turns out, he had just been released from prison not too long ago for offenses towards minors. We didn't get any details, though, and we never found out whose blood was smeared all over the interior of the van. For context, I am a 14 year old, and two days ago, something very creepy and unnerving happened to me. I am on the cross country team at my school, and our coach wants us to stay in shape during quarantine, so I was going on a run. I tend to run early in the morning, around 5.30 or 6, because the weather is cooler and less people are out and about. 
it's also nice to get your run over with so that the rest of the day is free. For you to understand exactly what happened, I need to explain the route that I run, so bear with me. I live in a nicer neighborhood in the US. My neighborhood is also near a major road. When I go on my run, I leave my neighborhood, travel down the main road, and enter a different neighborhood that is close to my own. This neighborhood has a low crime rate, is on the richer side, and goes along a big reservoir. It has lots of hills, and some of the bigger houses near the entrance of the neighborhood are backed up against some woods. I run through it because I like to look at the big houses, and sometimes some of the wildlife, such as deer, which sometimes makes its way out of the woods. When I run through it early in the morning, I get to enjoy the lack of people and the bird song. You need to understand that I run this route every morning, and no strange occurrences have happened with me being there. Now that you understand this setup, I'll tell you what happened. Like I said, this was two days ago. I left my house and neighborhood per usual and ran along the major road to the entrance of the neighborhood that I usually run in. Almost as soon as I come across the first house on the street, one of the ones that is backed up against some woods, I hear a rustling in the bushes. I think, oh cool, it's probably one of the deer, and slow down to try to spot it. But it never came out of the bushes. So I pick up my pace and continue along. Not long after that, maybe two minutes later, I hear someone on a bike behind me. This isn't unusual, so I don't think much about it, until the guy on the bike says, beep beep. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe he doesn't have a bell or something, so I move over to the right to let the guy pass me on my left. But he doesn't. He stays right behind me. I'm not a slow runner, but someone on a bike would definitely be faster than me. If you have ever tried to go really slow on a bike, you will understand how hard it is to keep your balance. So I'm thinking, okay this is really weird, I have a feeling that this guy is bad news and I need to shake him. So I slow to a stop and get over to the side of the road to tie my shoe, which doesn't really need to be tied and to see if he'll pass me. He doesn't. He just stopped. When it becomes clear that he isn't going anywhere, I get back on the sidewalk and keep running. Bad choice, I know, but I was panicking. Of course, the man on the bike follows, but even though my attempt to shake him didn't work, I did get a good look at him. He was tall and thin, with glasses, and he wore a Nirvana t-shirt. He definitely looked like a serial killer. As an avid reader of horror novels and an obsessive listener of scary podcasts, I was already thinking of the absolute worst possible outcome. I was going to be murdered when I had been out of my house for less than 10 minutes. Worse, I was over two miles from my house, so I was going to have to continue running. Now. I know that what I should have done was go to the closest house and let the family that lived in it know what was going on, but I wasn't thinking clearly. So I kept running, and the man on the bike kept following me at a meticulously slow pace. I was tired, sweaty, and near tears. I wanted to go home. Home was the only thing on my mind. I started looking around for ways to lose him or hide. Just up ahead of me was a sharp turn. My hope was that I could get around the turn faster than him, and then hide. Not a very well developed plan, but better than being killed by a random person. I sprinted around the corner as fast as I could, right into a young woman who was out walking her two dogs. Big dogs. German shepherds, actually. I started to apologize profusely trying to look calm. Apparently, I did not look calm at all, because she asked me what was wrong. The man was still behind me, practically breathing down my neck. I stared at the woman, pleading with my eyes, and said, H How is your walk going, Mom? I prayed that she would understand, 
that she would play along. And fortunately for me, she did. She smiled at me and said, Where were you? Me and your father were looking all over for you. We both then turned to look at the man on the bike, who looked extremely shocked. He turned around and quickly pedaled away, almost running into an oncoming car. As soon as he was gone, I broke down crying, telling the woman everything. She was very sympathetic and kind, and she ended up calling my parents to come pick me up. I was still sobbing when they arrived, and I had to catch my breath before telling them what happened. Looking back, I am almost positive that if I hadn't run into that woman, that something awful would have happened. I'm not sure if the rustling in the bushes at the entrance of the neighborhood was that man, or not, but I am completely content with never knowing. I have not been back to that neighborhood since, and I'm not sure if I ever will. Hey, this is Being Scared. I really hope you're enjoying the video, and if you are, please consider subscribing if you aren't already. I promise I will never stop making these videos for you, and there will always be minimal ads. Alright, back to the stories. This happened back in the summer of ninth grade, so I was invited to sleep over at this kid named Jacob's house. Jacob had this reputation for having a bad family and just being weird and awkward himself. He was in my math class, and I was partnered up with him for a project where I helped boost his mark, so I guess he sort of warmed up to me. For his birthday, he held a sleepover and invited three other kids and myself to come. I didn't really want to go, but I told my friends about the invitation, and they convinced me to just go, saying that it would be fun, and that I would figure out what kind of guy Jacob really was. I was hyped up by my friends, and decided to go after all. I was dropped off by my mom, and when I stepped onto the porch, I realized that the doorbell looked broken, like the rectangular case that covered the wiring and stuff was shattered. I had a sudden fear of being electrocuted, so I went to knock instead. Just as I raised my fist, I noticed some muffled shouting from within the house, loud enough to be heard over the hum of my mom's car's engine. The shouting kind of alarmed me, and I turned to look at the car, which was waiting for me to enter the house. I started having second thoughts of staying, but the idea of looking like a coward in front of my friends motivated me to knock loudly. The shouting cut abruptly, so abruptly that I thought that they were just watching TV or something, and then muted it when I knocked. The door suddenly swung open, and I was expecting a huge, looming figure to tower over me, but all I saw was skinny, pale Jacob. His face brightened when he saw me, and he ushered me inside. I waved to my mom and watched her back out of the driveway and drive down the road. I peered into the house, but from the entrance, I could only see the living room, a staircase, and a hallway. All three areas were empty, but I saw the flickering light of a TV from the turn of the hall. Jacob took me upstairs into the very last room. It was an extraordinarily clean room, with a dresser and a bed pushed together into the corner, and an analog clock hanging from the wall, leaving a lot of the room completely empty. To my dismay, I was the first one there. I thought of how awkward it would be if no one else showed up, and that thought made me panic a bit. I sat down on the carpet and pulled my iPod Touch out of my backpack, asking Jacob to put in his Wi-Fi's password. He took my iPod and fiddled around with it for at least five minutes. Each minute grew longer and more awkward, until I asked, Did you forget the password? Jacob bit his lip, and then the doorbell rang. I jumped to my feet and told him, I'll get it, you just try and remember the password. I hurried down the stairs and opened the front door, where I saw a kid that I didn't know very well. 
I only knew he was in our grade. I brought him upstairs, telling him, Oh, I'm glad you came. I thought I would be the only one. To which he said, I wouldn't have come if my mother didn't make me. We walked into the room, and I noticed Jacob wasn't in it anymore. I didn't think much of it, and took the opportunity to get familiar with the other guy. He told me that his name was Lance, and that he had once helped Jacob by giving him a few extra dollars to buy his lunch, and he didn't think Jacob would remember him. We both talked about the rumors about Jacob, and whether he actually had bad parents, or if he was just going through a phase. At some points, we heard loud thuds downstairs, to which we would shut up and widen our eyes at each other. The thudding would stop, and after a few moments, we would continue chatting. I told him about the shouting, but how it could have just been the television. Lance shook his head, and said that he once saw Jacob with his parents in the grocery store, and they had been arguing then, too. At this point, I was glad that I came, because I started to pity Jacob. And that's when he entered the room. I'm sorry I'm late, he said, sounding out of breath. I was trying to get the Wi-Fi password, but it's down right now, the Wi-Fi. Sorry. I told him it was okay, took my iPod from him, and told him that there was always something else we could do. We all waited for the two other boys that Jacob invited to come. It started to become apparent that they wouldn't, and I made up excuses for both of them after I saw the crestfallen look on Jacob's face. We awkwardly chatted for a bit, ate some chips, and talked about our schedules and stuff for 10th grade. He told us he would be moving away before September, and Lance and I asked normal questions to keep the conversation going. Then, after the small talk got tiring, we agreed to fall asleep early. We all brushed our teeth and changed, and then Jacob went to his bed while Lance and I slept on the floor in our sleeping bags. After trying to sleep for what I would say was about 15 minutes, I grabbed my iPod, turned the brightness down, and started to scroll through it. After I got bored with the games and such, I went to my messages and decided to read back on some conversations with my friends. That's when I noticed that on the top, where newly messaged people were, was an unknown number. Confused, I pressed on it and was horrified to see that a bunch of pictures that I had took of my friends and myself were sent to this number from my camera roll. And all of them read, delivered, which meant I was connected to a source of internet for these to be sent. I could only think of Jacob as the culprit, and I got really freaked out, because he had just sent my pictures to somebody, and I didn't remember Jacob ever having a phone. I didn't know what to do, so I shook Lance awake, keeping my eyes on Jacob, who was still asleep. It took Lance forever to wake up, but I managed to make him turn around and look at me through bleary eyes. In a whisper, I asked, Can you come to the bathroom with me? Lance groaned and turned back around, muttering, Dude, no. I shook him violently and told him that he needed to come with me, and I annoyed him so much that he pushed himself out of his sleeping bag and hit me hard on the arm. I was so panicked, I didn't care, and I dragged him out of the room. I shoved him in the bathroom and locked the door, and he looked seriously freaked out. What the hell are you doing? He asked angrily, and I showed him my messages and explained the situation. He told me that he must have sent it by mistake or something, but I told him that this was an iPod, and I couldn't send anything without Wi-Fi. Lance's angry look had shifted to look nervously excited now, and he assured me I was overreacting. But we can call the number on my phone if you want, he said, and I thought that was a good idea. So Lance turned on his cellular data and dialed the number displaying on my messages. The ringing started a bit late, and then we heard the music of an incoming call coming in from one of the other rooms. It took a second for us to realize this, and when we did, we both went into a flurry of shocked nervousness. 
Lance muted the ringing on his phone and tiptoed out of the bathroom. We heard the ringing coming from one of the bedrooms as we tiptoed down the corridor, and we both shared a terrified look. When we went back into Jacob's room, he was sitting up in his bed and scratching his head. Lance quickly ended the call and nudged me, like I should have confronted him or something. Jacob asked us what we were doing, and Lance just looked at me, expecting me to answer. I told Jacob I had to go to the bathroom, and Lance was already awake, so I took him along. Jacob just kind of sat there, so Lance and I curled back into our sleeping bags. Neither Lance nor I actually slept. We just turned our backs on each other and lay there, breathing heavily, unsure what to do about this situation. Oddly, I drifted off to sleep and was awoken by Lance early in the morning. He let me call my mom and I asked her to pick me and Lance up since Lance didn't have a ride that early in the morning. We told Jacob goodbye, thanks for inviting us over, and all of that. I really wanted to say something about the messages to him, but I was really, really creeped out, and didn't want to make the whole thing awkward. He did move late August, and I never told my parents about this, only my friends. This happened three years ago. I now have this weird paranoia of handing people my phone, locked or unlocked. This happened in 1985 when I was 17 years old. I was the youngest of my graduating class, and all summer I had been looking at colleges across the region. This is long enough ago that there wasn't any internet, and if you wanted to go to college out of state, and if you didn't have tons of money or connections, you would actually have to take a trip. I was born in Seattle, but at this time my family had been living in Mount Shasta, which is a small town in Northern California. I was unable to attend college on time with the rest of my friends because I ended up having to stay home and take care of my mother. She ended up being diagnosed with cancer at the end of summer and my dad had to continue working 10 hour days in order to pay the bills. So I took care of my mom for a year while my dad worked. Luckily my mom didn't have to suffer for long the cancer had progressed so far by the time they caught it that she passed away in the fall. After my mom passed, my dad made sure I started college as soon as possible. I knew I wanted to go to school in Seattle because the big city life was calling to me. Dad basically handed me $500 and the keys to his old 1982 Chevrolet pickup and told me to go, and that when I got there, he would send me money to get an apartment so I could make my way in the city before school started. He didn't want any obstacles in my way when it came to school. He felt guilty for having kept me home while my mom was dying. Not that I would have chosen to be anywhere else, but he was still feeling guilty. So in the middle of fall, I ended up driving my dad's truck north to Seattle. The trip is basically a straight shot from Mount Shasta to Seattle on Interstate 5. It should have been easy, but about halfway through Oregon, the pickup truck broke down. A coolant hose sprung a leak, and I was unable to repair it on the side of the road, so I ended up walking on the side of the interstate northward in the direction of the next town. I had just passed a small town named Green a while back, and the map said I was just south of a medium-sized town named Roseburg. I couldn't be sure how far away from Roseburg I was, but walking wasn't a problem for me, and Roseburg would be much more likely to have a repair shop, so even if it might be further away, it was totally worth the attempt. It was cold that evening, and the wind chill was cutting through my coat and causing me to hate life. I decided it would be best to hitch a ride to Roseburg, since it was getting dark quickly. I thought I looked pretty hot back then. But even still, no one stopped to give me a lift. I kept walking north and putting my thumb out every time a car came up behind me. It was hours later when one finally stopped. It was a big red 18-wheeler that had no trailer attached. 
It pulled up in front of me and off to the side of the road and honked its horn. I ran up to the truck, thankful that I could finally get out of the wind. As I opened the passenger side door of the truck, I saw a very friendly looking man at the wheel. He smiled and said, Come on up inside. As I climbed into the passenger seat, he told me his name was Rick, and I introduced myself in turn. He asked me where I was headed, and I told him I needed to get to Roseburg to get a tow truck to pick up my vehicle I left a few miles back. He told me he had been to Roseburg many times on his routes, and that there wasn't a repair shop or tow truck company open this late at night. He told me he would let me out at a motel so I could sleep the night, and then get the tow truck and pick my vehicle up the next morning. I thanked him for his considerate nature. He really did seem kind and thoughtful. We weren't far from Roseburg, according to him, which made sense because we could just now begin seeing signs of civilization amongst the trees on the side of the interstate. We made small talk while he drove the rest of the way. We discussed the cold weather, current events, and even sports. Somewhere in the conversation, he told me that I was very pretty. It caught me off guard, but he didn't say it in a creepy manner. So I merely thanked him and continued talking about sports. He didn't say anything after that. Kind of just let me talk. You know that feeling that you get when you realize you've been chatting on and on about something and the other person hasn't said a word for a few minutes? Well, I got that feeling because he hadn't said a word since he told me I was pretty. I stopped and apologized for being so chatty and talking his ear off. He looked at me and smiled and said that it was all right and that he likes to hear my pretty voice. That time, he did say it in a creepy way. But sometimes that happens. I doubted that he meant to do that. I kept quiet in hopes that he would start talking, and we would discuss something else. Instead, we didn't say a word. We watched the road, and I just sat there. In a minute, I began looking around the cab, and I ended up looking in the back of the cab behind me. What I saw puzzled me. In the back there was a large brown blanket, some clothes, I'm sure were dirty, and some shoes. The thing that puzzled me was that there was no way that the clothes were all his. Two pairs of the shoes were obviously a little girl's, and some of the clothes also obviously were for a little girl. Something you would expect a ten-year-old to wear. He knew I had seen it and laughed. He told me his daughter had left those in the cab after she had accompanied him on a route last week. He told me he didn't get enough time to spend with her, so we took her on a route a week ago to spend some quality time together. I said that was nice of him and asked him how old she was. He paused for a second and then told me she was thirteen. That made me suspicious because not only did he hesitate before answering, but I've worked in a shoe store before, and I know that those shoes must belong to a much younger girl, both because of the size and the style. It also didn't seem like the kind of clothes or shoes that you would have a little girl bring on a trip like this. It was weird, but not scary. Also, having worked at a shoe store before, I was almost positive those shoes were two different sizes. I told him the shoes were cute and leaned back and grabbed one of them and proved to myself that they had to be different sizes. And no way does a little girl wear two totally different sizes. Still, I wasn't really scared. I just thought he wasn't being totally honest. And that's his business, so I didn't really mind. It was just a weird thing to be dishonest about even to a stranger. I put the shoe back, and when I turned around, I saw the look on his face. He seemed half worried and half angry. I immediately apologized for touching his things, and he said that it was okay, although it didn't look that way. By then we were just entering Roseburg. We kept driving through the town, and he told me he knew a good motel on the far end of town and that he would let me out there. 
He asked me what I had brought with me in my backpack. It seemed like an innocent question, but it came off like he was interested in what I had on me. Not simply whether or not I had brought any clothes or a toothbrush. I told him I had enough, but I didn't tell him anything specific about the contents of my backpack. I didn't have a weapon of any type. Just some socks, makeup, and my purse. We ended up passing a repair shop on the side of the road, and he pointed to it and told me that that's the place I should go to tomorrow morning to get a tow truck. It felt kind of strange to me, because he didn't tell me that it was coming up. He just pointed it out. I said I had missed it, and asked what the name of the shop was. He responded by just telling me it was straight south off the interstate, and I can't miss it, as if he didn't remember the name. At this point, I began to get a little worried. I didn't feel threatened by Rick, but he didn't seem to be legit. As we kept driving, I noticed that we were now coming to the far north end of Roseburg, and that soon, we would be leaving the town behind. I asked him where this motel is, and he told me that it was just north of the town. I told him that was a little far from the repair shop for me, and asked if there was any place closer for me to stay. He didn't answer, and now I'm worried about Rick's intentions for me. I got my backpack and put it in my lap. He looked over and saw it and asked if I was okay. I looked over and smiled at him and told him yes, I was okay, just cold. You know those signs on the highway that tell you how far off the next rest stop, gas station, or motel is? Well, they had those back then too but usually only on the outskirts of a town. It's the town's way of motivating you to stop for gas or lodging now where they can tax it, rather than continuing on and sleeping somewhere unincorporated. Well, we came up on one of those signs. It said there wouldn't be a motel for 20 miles, and we were leaving Roseburg. I knew then that Rick wasn't taking me to a motel just past the town's limit. I didn't know what he wanted, but I didn't want it to happen. I looked over slowly at Rick, and luckily he hadn't seen the sign, I think, because he was busy lighting a cigarette. I began looking frantically out the window to see if there were any places that I could make an excuse to stop at. Maybe I could ask to stop at a gas station for something to drink, and then run away, but there wasn't one anywhere. I decided that I would have to pull out the big guns and ask him to pull over so I could pee. I looked over at him and asked if he would pull over to let me pee on the side of the road. He pulled his lit cigarette out of his mouth and looked at me. He asked, You gotta pee? And I nodded my head, yes. Well, go ahead and pee then, Jenny, he told me. I like the smell, and he smiled at me, and it sent shivers down my spine. I pretended to laugh, and he frowned at me. Don't laugh at me, Jenny, he said. I immediately stopped pretending to be fine, and so did Rick. He could tell I was scared now, and he just gave me this look like he wanted to hit me. I asked him where we were going and he told me not to worry about that. At this point, I could actually see the end of Roseburg coming up ahead. No more lights after that. Just woods. Immediately I heard my dad's voice in my head telling me to run. Not to worry about getting hurt. Just run. I opened the door and tried to jump out. The truck must have been moving at 30 or 40 miles per hour. And as I moved towards the open door, Rick grabbed my backpack. He had been trying to grab me, but I was pressed against the far end of the cab. I heard my dad's voice again, telling me to run, and I tried to pull my backpack away from Rick, but his grip was too strong. I gave up and just fell back out of the cab and into the grass. The impact knocked the wind out of me, and I rolled around in the grass until I came to a stop. I immediately sat up despite the sharp pain in my back and saw Rick's truck speeding up on his way out of town. He didn't stop. I got up and limped my way back into town 
and ran up to the first home I saw and pounded on the front door. An old man opened the door, looking very tired, yet also very worried. I begged him to call the cops, and when he saw the bruises on my face and the grass stains on my clothes, he threw open the door and let me come in. He sat me on the couch while he ran to the phone. His wife came down to find me on the couch crying and him on the phone, telling the local sheriff to come as soon as possible. She got me a glass of water and a blanket. They were both so nice to me. The sheriff arrived and expected me to be drunk at first. About halfway through my story, he realized I wasn't drunk and that there was truth to the story I was telling. He called up two deputies who were asleep at home and had them patrol north on the interstate looking for a big red 18-wheeler. He even called up the next town north and asked them to send a patrol south. They didn't find any red 18-wheelers on the road, but they assumed that he probably sped his way right through their town too before they were able to send out a patrol. The nice old couple who had let me in ended up letting me stay with them that night. The sheriff kept a deputy outside the house all night. The next day he took me to the station to fill out an official report and look at some photos of 18-wheelers so I could pick out the exact color and model. He drove me back to the repair shop, which just happened to be the same one Rick pointed out to me. He had them tow my truck in and had the sheriff's department pay for it. They got my dad's pickup running in no time at all, and the sheriff asked me to stay in town for a few more nights. I was totally fine with that, because I didn't want to meet Rick on the road again. I stayed at the old couple's home for three more nights, and spent my days with the sheriff as we patrolled the interstate and called nearby towns, asking if any truckers had been pulled over, matching my description. I did stay in contact with the sheriff and the old couple who helped me. The old couple both passed away about a year and a half later. I went to their funerals and spoke to their kids, who were about my dad's age at the time, and told them everything their parents had done for me. They were very proud of their parents. I even stayed at their home on my way back down from Seattle when I eventually brought my dad's truck back to him. The sheriff would call me from time to time and ask if he could send me some photos. It seemed every few months he would arrest a trucker who had a red semi or similar vehicle and he would want to see if I recognized him. He says that Rick probably didn't frequent that route as much as he said he did because he didn't seem too familiar with the town, which was one reason I was suspicious of him. Odds are Rick was a serial killer or at least a child abductor and sexual predator. But he travels the United States, and there is no way to know where he is now. At the time, I suspected he was around 40, which means he would be in his 70s now, and probably no longer on the road. The sheriff told me many years later that there are tons of old folks in retirement homes who have had no families and no one ever visits them. And Rick is probably living that kind of life now, if he is still alive. Wherever Rick is now, I hope he never really hurt anyone. Or at least, I hope he never hurt anyone ever again. But if he did, especially if he did hurt two little girls, whose shoes I found in that truck, then I hope that wherever he is, he is suffering and alone, and all of these years later, we never did find Rick. This story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking to the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. 
Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the Lassen National Forest in northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their forties. They looked like the couple who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandon personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that I did not find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bare precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food wasn't there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite, and so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find any, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite. Two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the couple I had passed earlier, and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than the food. Several days passed, and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal, or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out, claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash at whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps. No more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise, and then opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence that something had actually happened were the boot prints, the same as before. Several more days passed, and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail. Being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line, I could see the trail winding for miles in front of and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, This trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella, located off I-5. The only problem was that it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night, trying to gain as much ground as possible. 
I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps. The whispering. The sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is messed up. This is so messed up. Damn it. Finally a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing, and then goes dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. It was sort of like that cliché scene in movies where people in the wilderness hear sticks breaking around them and the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound is coming from. Then, I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped again, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain they were gone, but I didn't move. Eventually birds started chirping, and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke with the police and forest service. They put me up in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later, who told me that there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forests. However, there had been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, the couple were never identified. This happened in Antioch, California. It was around 2 a.m. I was at a friend's house, safe in warm, sheltered suburbia. We were having a lot to drink, chit-chatting, enjoying ourselves. Of course, when you're having fun, time hits the fast-forward button, and those few minutes turned into an hour. I had too much to drink. My friend has a bit of an abrupt bedtime, so I had to dodge out early, still intoxicated. I felt too shameful thinking that I would be asking too much to stay in his house, to sleep off the drunkenness. I suppose he was either too rude or too drunk to consider it himself. Whatever. Sometimes a little inconvenience makes you appreciate everything else. I needed about another hour or so to sober up and drive back. As fast as time passed during my stay, it decided to drastically slow down as soon as I stepped out of his house. It was a cul-de-sac area, a concrete jungle with the stem of the street breaking into a fork. Alongside the road, my car was parked. The only street light that worked was in the middle of the cul-de-sac circle, about 80 yards away. I stumbled towards my car, produced my keys, felt the metal line up, opened my door, and shifted to the back seat. Because this was a dark, strange, and unfamiliar neighborhood, I took the leftover newspapers and a sweater in my back seat to cover myself up. I was a little scared. I wanted to camouflage myself and not just be some guy awkwardly sitting in his car, waiting for time to pass, in order to drive home. I couldn't fall asleep. The uncomfortable feeling of a cheap backseat bed, enshrouded in darkness, didn't make the chance of slumber easier. It felt too ominous, and of course, my mind began to wander. I thought of worst-case scenarios, 
like how the police would shine their lights on me through the window, or a drunk driver hitting my car, and... Wait. In the distance, about 100 yards away, I could hear footsteps approaching. The gravel scuffed with each step forward, growing in proximity, but periodically taking stops. I wondered why, until it made sense in my mind. Whoever it was was probably looking through cars carefully, with the intent to steal one. I couldn't recall how many cars were on the block, but I counted three full stops until he was at my window, breathing. I froze. There was no more than one foot between us. The car encapsulated me as I lay hidden beneath backseat clutter, forming myself into an object trying my hardest to be unnoticeable, unmoving, and simply not there. I see you, said a man in perverse baby talk. Imagine when you were playing hide and seek and one of your friends tricks you into coming out. He said it in that tone of voice, as if baiting me, like he was questioning whether the clutter in the back seat was just clutter or a person. I didn't want to move or check the window. I remained clutter. Give me an Academy Award. My body reacted by minimizing my breathing so much that I felt paralyzed. I dare not look. My eyes fixated on the back of the passenger seat. I didn't blink. I didn't move. I didn't breathe. My heart was pounding so hard It shook my body with each throb. He circled around the car. My ears didn't fail me. I heard the steps. I felt like I was part of the car. I could feel him touching the trunk as he carefully pressed down on it, as if to test the alarm, as if to test me. I was in the middle of fight or flight. I couldn't do either without elevating danger. I was frozen and hoping that he was bluffing. He circled the car again. The door handle to my right jiggled. He was pulling it multiple times. I see you. Same tone, but more agitated and stressed. More convinced that he was trying to make that clutter move, revealing itself to be of his expectations. That it was me. My muscles tensed like a cow before slaughter. Tap, tap, tap. That had to be metal against glass. Take a penny right now and tap your window. A crowbar? A knife? A rock? A gun? My eyes fixated on the seat in front of me, never averting my gaze like he was. I was covered enough to where I couldn't see beyond the seat in front of me, I know I couldn't see him, but I could feel his eyes resting on top of me. My name is Poker Face. What's your name? The voice changed, a lower, demented, and serious tone. My mind forced a visual. It wasn't anything human. I already accepted my death. I was ready to be shot in the head, ready to take a life-changing bullet multiple knife wounds just make this sleep bearable not excruciating as you drain me of life I wouldn't know how to react my thoughts grew dimmer I imagined my friend waking up the next morning after a calm night of safe and sound sleep only to discover my mutilated defiled and bloodied body hanging outside my car door it was then I heard nothing but my own heart. What was this person doing now? Just staring at me in the middle of the night? Talking to me? Or a messy pile in the back seat? Time froze. The footsteps were being swallowed in the distance. He left. I waited another hour until the sun showed hints of itself. I jumped in my front seat and bolted out of there, wide-eyed and sober.
Yesterday I was at my sister's house with my mom, watching my son and nephews play in the yard. One of my nephews, Harrison, was picking bark off of a tree when I remembered an odd encounter that I had as a kid. I said out loud, This is so weird, thinking about the encounter. My mom inquired what I was talking about, so I told her. When I was a kid, I was hanging out at the Pinecone Forest, which was what the neighborhood kids called a small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off of one of the trees to pass some time, waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework and come out to play. Out of nowhere, it seemed, a man walked up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He smelled like stale cigarette smoke. I was a bit scared when I looked at him. He wasn't very old, but he had a very lazy eye that was cloudy, and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people even if they didn't look like me, so I faked a smile and said hello. What are you doing? He asked me. The smell of his breath was the worst. Um, I'm picking the bark off this tree. You shouldn't do that. It's like picking off the tree's skin. How would you feel if someone picked off your skin? He said, while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow nails. I don't know. I replied and took my arm back. Just then Frankie's mom called for me out the door and told me to come and wait inside. I didn't think anything of the situation at that time. When I told my mom about it, she had this look of guilt. She said that it's probably time that I know the whole story. She thought I forgot about the whole encounter, so she never brought it up to me. First you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in was a small tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone, and there was no reason for an outsider to come in unless they knew someone there. So here's what happened with this guy. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed a white van with no windows parked on the side of the road. I know, it sounds cliche. She didn't recognize it, but figured maybe it was a visitor for a neighbor. Sonia told the police that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of just keeping an eye on it. She said she just had a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in front facing the pine cone forest, and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van while holding the phone just in case. She saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him approach me, she called the cops, and as soon as she got off the phone, she called me into her house. The cops stopped the guy just outside of my neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. Me at school, at my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom, just me everywhere I went. But that's not all. He had a key to a storage unit on him. Inside the unit, they found a cabinet full of knives. And I mean, a lot of knives. There was also a few anatomy books, equipment, duct tape, and ten empty five-gallon buckets. In the middle of the unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps. And the entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic wrap. My mom said that he was in a high-security mental institution for the criminally insane the last time she heard anything about him. Back in 2007, shortly after my 15th birthday, my mom was out of town for a few days on a business trip. My mom and I lived alone in a small house in a neighborhood that was on the sketchier end of a decent city. And that fact, combined with her paranoia about me being home alone longer than four or five hours, meant that I had to stay over at a friend's house while she was gone. This friend's house was across the street, and one house over from my own. The place my mom was going was about two hours away, 
and I told her that I was old enough to take care of myself, and insisting that I could just check in with my friend's parents every now and then. But in truth, my house was pretty creepy at night, even when my mom was there with me, and I had found out the day that my mom was scheduled to leave that my friend had somehow gotten her hands on a PlayStation 3, so it didn't take me too long to get over being unfairly babysat. At around 11 o'clock on the last night I was there, we ended up back in my friend's room, screwing around with a brand new flip phone that I had gotten for my birthday. Her parents had gone out hours earlier after buying us a pizza for dinner and probably weren't going to be back for at least an hour, and we had gotten bored downstairs with her one PS3 game that we had been playing for days already. It was too late to call any of our friends, but I knew my mom was coming home tomorrow morning at some ungodly hour, and I knew that she had this thing about our answering machine. No matter how tired she was, no matter where she had gotten back from, if there were any messages on the answering machine, she would listen to all of them. Being the bored 15-year-olds we were, my friend and I decided to leave a message or two for my mom to find in the morning. We called my home phone and put it on speaker, cracking up and trying to figure out what our message was going to be about. It normally took five rings for a call to go to the machine, but on the third ring, the phone picked up, and we hear, Hello? The voice sounded like it belonged to some man who had been smoking for the last 40 years of his life, but even past that, there was this menace to his voice that I can't describe. It sounded very cold and very dangerous. The sort of voice where if you heard it on the street, you would want to get away from the person immediately. I looked at my friend. Her eyes were huge and her face was completely pale, and I'm sure I didn't look any better. Neither of us could get it together to say anything in response. Hello, he said again. There was a pause, and I tried to squeak out something along the lines of, Who the hell are you and why are you in my house? But then he said in a very low voice, You should not have called. There was some sort of slam, and the call disconnected. I immediately dropped my phone and proceeded to freak out, as did my friend. She asked me if I knew who that was, and I said no. Of course I didn't know the creepy guy answering my phone at 11 o'clock at night. We checked the call log to see if we had accidentally called the wrong number. Nope. It was the right number. We were so shaken up that we couldn't immediately figure out who we should call or what we should do. If we should call the cops, or call my mom, or call my friend's parents, or run around making sure all the doors and windows were locked, or what? So we ended up sprinting around my friend's house, double-checking every lock we could check, while gasping out what happened to my friend's parents on the phone. They were about 15 minutes away and said that they would call 911, and her mother told us to stay in my friend's room with the door locked and all the lights on in case this guy was going from house to house. And so for 10 minutes we were huddled in the far corner of my friend's room, basically under her bed, jumping every time the house settled or one of our legs scraped on the carpet. You can imagine how freaked out we were when her parents rushed in and started rattling at her bedroom door, forgetting that it was locked on their orders. The cops got to my house not too long after her parents got home. To be honest, I don't really remember a lot of the specifics about what the cops were doing, mainly because I refused to set foot outside the house, but I remember that they asked my friend and I a lot of questions. We couldn't really give them much information, unfortunately. We called from my friend's room, which was in the back of her house, away from where we would have been able to see my house, and the guy with the creepy voice isn't a very helpful description to go off of when looking for someone. One question they asked stuck out, because I remember thinking it was weird for them to ask who had had the keys to get into the house. I told them only my mom and I had the keys. I found out later that the reason the police asked that was because there were no signs of forced entry anywhere around the house, and that the front door was wide open when they got there. There wasn't really anything messed up and nothing was taken, 
but our wall-mounted corded phone was hanging off the hook, and the phone base itself was cracked, like it had been smashed with something. Both my mom's room and my room also had some stuff moved around and displaced, like someone was going through our drawers and the stuff in our rooms. My mom was called at some point during all of this and managed to get home that night, very tired and very freaked out about what had happened. The cops investigated the incident but never came up with any answers. We weren't doing too well financially at that point, but we still managed to move across town within a few months of this happening. For the months between that night and the day we moved, though, I slept like crap and had really bad nightmares. I also flat out refused to be alone in that house, even for a couple of minutes, and started getting really obsessive about checking and double checking the locks, a habit which has stuck around since this happened. And now that I have told you the story, I remember that there's one thing that I haven't told anyone else about this, mostly because at the time, I thought that the whole thing might get blamed on me if I said anything. Earlier that day, I had gone back over to my house to get a notebook of mine, full of writing that I wanted to show my friend. Nothing was obviously wrong as far as I could tell. The front door was locked when I got to it. No signs of any tampering with it, or any weirdness by the door. No noises from any part of the house. But the minute I stepped inside, something just felt off. Really off. It was really, really quiet. I was getting chills all up and down my spine, and I had goosebumps all over. I tried to will myself to just get over it, to go back to my room to get the notebook but I couldn't make myself take more than a few steps into the house. I was too creeped out. I locked the door and ran back across the street. When I got back to my friend's house, I felt like an idiot, of course. Was I really such a wimp that I couldn't walk through my own house when it was empty? But looking back, well, who knows? Maybe my gut was right about something just not being right. It freaks me out even thinking about what could have happened if I had ignored it and walked further inside. I have thought back on that moment a lot too, wondering if maybe I had left the door open when I left. But there's no way. I distinctly remember locking the deadlock and looking over my shoulders the whole time, because I had that burning, crawling feeling on the back of my neck that you get when you're being watched. And after that creepy call... I checked, and I had my keys in my backpack. Hey, this is Being Scared. I hope you're enjoying the video so far, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider it. I will never stop making these videos for you. Always with minimal ads. Alright, back to the stories. If you ever want to hear some of the most messed up stories you'll ever find in your life, just ask the regular graveyard guy at your local all-night convenience store for some of the stuff they have seen. And bring some popcorn. In my life, I have been the graveyard guy for not one, not two, but three different 7-Eleven locations. And I'm going to bring the bulk of my horror stories to you right now. This one is about a gentleman named Richard. Working the graveyard shift, I was the lone employee from just after 10 o'clock at night to just before 6 a.m. in the morning. Not only that, but the next nearest all-night anything was another convenience store over two miles away. From my store, you could just barely see the light pollution of their neon sign. This setup alone made for many interesting happenings, and tonight, it was a Saturday night going into Sunday morning, just after 4 a.m., when a middle-aged man with thick glasses and a weak old stubble walked in. He wasn't unpleasant at first. He made small talk as he walked through the store, sometimes to me, sometimes to himself. He mentioned things about the weather. 
He asked about the hot dogs and the taquitos on the grill. It was what it was at first. But then, the comments started slipping in. Minor vulgarities and weird things. After walking around the store for a good 20 minutes, he comes up to the register to check out, without anything to actually buy. I asked if he needed help with anything, and he asked me what I knew about the Antichrist. I exhaled. Uh, alright, well, I know enough, I guess. I was raised Catholic, so I know quite a bit on this subject, I guess. And so, he just stares at me, eyes wide, mouth pursed. I wasn't sure if he was about to bite me on the face or kiss me on the lips, and not being able to tell the difference made me uneasy. The man then said, I should get a hot dog. I responded, Uh, alright. Which one? One of the big ones. I want to enjoy it. There will be no more hot dogs once the Antichrist comes. It sounds like a ridiculous statement. Okay, it is a ridiculous statement. But when said with genuine menace, it becomes a thinly veiled harbinger of doom. I did my best to ignore it, got his bread and his hot dog, and handed it over to him. He walked around to the condiment bar, and he continued. Do you have onions? Uh, yeah. I love onions. Longer than necessary pause. Yeah, uh, a lot of people do. They better enjoy them. There will be no more onions once the Antichrist comes. There's really no way to respond to this, so I try to go back about my work. But even as I walk, as I stock cigarettes and start my nightly count, I can feel him watching every move that I make. He comes up to the register with his hot dog, pays, and I'm hoping that we are finally done. I then say to him, uh, thanks for coming. You have a good night. And I turn my back. The man then responds. Can I eat this here? Uh, that's probably not a good idea. The manager comes in at about 5.30, and he doesn't like it if anyone's just hanging out in here. Stuff to do, you know? The man responded. I'm not worried about him. The crappy part about this is that I was actually partially lying. The manager, James, my boss, and a really awesome guy, did arrive somewhere between 5.30 and 5.45, every morning, Monday through Friday, but he avoided the place like the plague on the weekends. I was trying to sell something that I knew wouldn't fly if this guy actually stuck around long enough for no one to show up, and now he was telling me he wasn't concerned about someone else showing up. Saturday nights are a busy time for convenience stores, but after about 3.30, they become a ghost town, and it was just me and this guy for one extended, uninterrupted, messed up conversation after another. I would try to walk and stock the cups, lids, and straws, and he would pop up right beside me. There'll be no cups and straws when the Antichrist comes. I arranged the beer and the coffee There'll be no more coffee when the Antichrist comes. I realize it sounds like a joke, but his panicked eyes and horribly hinting smile made it clear. He was dead serious in everything he said. Five o'clock rolls around. Well, you should probably get going. Don't want that boss man getting mad, you know? The man responded. He won't get mad at you. Uh, it's just that he, he doesn't like people hanging out. We're just talking. Talking about the Bible. He said this so sickly sweet, it made my stomach churn. Yeah, but still, he's going to be here soon. I'm not worried about him. I need milk. I... Okay. I point to the display case. He walks back, grabs a thing of milk slowly and robotically inspects the carton all the way back to the register. I love milk, he says. 
Oh, really? Yup. But there'll be no more milk when the Antichrist comes. The devil won't allow that. It's holy sustenance. Alright, so at this point I'm sizing the guy up. He's about 5'9", and I'm about 6'4", and I've got at least 100 pounds on him. So if things do go south, I think I can get a few good knocks in before he pulls out my liver and puts it on his head. 5.10 a.m. You should really probably get going. Jesus loves all of his children. 5.15 a.m. The boss is going to be here really soon, man. I'm not worried about him. 5.20 a.m. Is there anything else you need? The devil is real. And then says my full name to me. This is where two things happen that if I hadn't lived through it, I would have called bullcrap to the person telling the story. At 5.30, for the first time in almost two years I had worked there, my boss James comes walking into the store on a Sunday morning. He actually managed to unbluff my bluff with this guy. Secondly, and this is the jaw-droppingly hilarious part, James had been to the beach on Saturday. James had fallen asleep at the beach on Saturday. James had shaved his head fresh before going to the beach on Saturday. In other words, just as I told him he would, my boss came walking in at 5.30 a.m. on the dot with a completely shaved head, his long dark goatee, and bright red skin. To James, I say, What the hell are you doing here? James responds, I, I honestly have no idea. He then looks at the guy. Who's this? I didn't answer. I looked at James. I looked at the guy, and then back at James. He looks at the guy. James then says to the guy, Let's go outside and chat, friend. Less than ten minutes later, the guy was walking off, and James came back into the store. So how are you? I respond. What was that all about? James says back. Oh, Richard? Well, he started telling me about Jesus. I started telling him about witchcraft. He said the Antichrist was coming. I said I was the Antichrist. I overloaded his circuits, I guess. So he left. I love James. I wish this is where the story ended, but... Three months later... I'm outside of my store, smoking a cigarette, with a few regular customers of mine, just chatting away. Somewhere in the distance I hear, Jesus Lord, God help me. I perk up, but the people I'm with don't seem to notice. Jesus please, I know you can help me. It's closer now, and I actually say, Oh, please don't be Richard. Jesus, Jesus Christ, come down from heaven and save me. Please, oh please, don't be Richard. Sure enough, barreling around the side of the building and heading in my direction is a panicked, screaming, sweaty Richard, covered in his own blood. The people I'm with ask the appropriate questions of, Holy hell, is he covered in blood? I, on the other hand had only one thought on my mind, and I repeated it over and over again. Don't go in the store, 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 don't go in the store. Damn it! I crush my cigarette out and run into the store. In the few seconds he has been in there, I now have blood all over the doors, the floors, the rugs, and the countertops. Jesus Christ, please come down and save me. I grab him some towels and toss them in his general direction, trying to get an idea of the nature of his wounds while dialing 911. Now, I can't be sure because I can't say as I've seen it before, but it looks quite possibly like he tried to crucify himself. All right then, 911. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, I have a gentleman in my store who is injured, screaming profanities yelling about Jesus, and is covered in his own blood. 911 then responds, What? 
His name is Richard, and I don't know how badly he's hurt, but yeah. I hear the lady on the phone typing away. She asks the store name and the address, etc. All right, and you said that he's screaming profanities? Richard, who can hear the lady on the phone, responds by screaming a very loud profanity. Did you happen to hear that? 911 responds. Yes, yes I did. And you said he's talking about Jesus? Richard, who can still hear her, responds by screaming, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, please help me! Did you happen to hear that? 911 responds. Yes, yes I did. And then Richard, in all his glory, does the one thing that makes any convenience store clerk go aggro. I turn away from him to give the operator the store incident number, and when I turn back around, Richard is now behind me, behind the register. I drop the phone. Richard, I don't care what's going on with you, man. If you don't get out from behind the counter, I will hang up with 911 and let you bleed to death right here in the store. But the confrontation didn't last long. Before he could respond, there were four police officers with me. I thanked the 911 operator, hung up, and left the area. Richard was handcuffed inside of an ambulance, and even the officer said that it appeared that he tried to do something harmful with religious significance. I thanked them for coming so quickly, and we laughed about the strangeness of it all. And then, I ask a question that I wish that I hadn't. Uh, so who cleans up all the blood? The lead officer responds. Uh, that would be you. I live in North Wales. For anyone who has had the pleasure of visiting, it truly is a beautiful place to live. Though for an adolescent boy, it is certainly lacking in things to do. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Despite it being quite sparsely populated in comparison to the closest cities, there is a dual carriageway running right along the coast from Wales into England. Also, train tracks run alongside this road for most of its course, occasionally passing overhead via a small cement bridge. There was one night a few years ago when about four of us randomly decided to try and explore the inside of one of these bridges, as one of the group had observed a manhole cover nearby, which we believed to be the entrance. On closer inspection, we discovered that several tools would be required in order to gain entry. We returned with the necessary equipment and proceeded to unbolt the cover. This had to be done stealthily as the train track was right beside us, not close enough to be in any danger, but definitely a sufficiently small distance to cause panic for any train driver. And panic usually means police. It wasn't long before we had removed the heavy steel disc and started descending the ladder down into the structure. Once we had all safely reached the bottom, we decided to progress to the other side. At this point, we are totally confined into the narrow space that leads into the main area. If you are confused as to what this bridge is supposed to be, you probably should be, because it was rather peculiar. I mean, I would never have known there was even an inside had we had not found the manhole cover. So, as we squeeze and crouch, and at one point scrape along our bellies to the other side of the structure, there is a growing sense of claustrophobia between us. The distance from end to the other is surprisingly long, but by the halfway point, you can look down through the narrow gaps onto the motorway below. This was actually pretty cool, which helped keep us calm in a strange way. At this point, apart from the mild discomfort and confinement, we were still just a group of guys on an adventure. This was about to change dramatically. No more than a few meters beyond halfway, which we could tell due to the symmetry of the passageways through the bridge. One of us claimed 
that they could see some object in the distance at the far end. Slightly hesitantly, we agreed to investigate. Bad move. I reached the end first, and let me tell you, I have never felt the same sense of dread before or since. In front of me was a single fold-away chair, positioned facing a wall. On the wall was a partially torn page from a newspaper or a magazine showing a fully naked lady in an erotic position. The reason I don't just refer to it as porn is because something was different about it. I can't put my finger on it, but it seemed more sinister than sexy, if that makes any sense. More disturbingly, the eyes of the woman on display had been cut from the page, removed with precision, not just hastily ripped off. The scene that lay before us had rendered us completely speechless, and an overpowering sense of panic could be felt collectively. That was when we found the condom, the horrendous, gut-wrenching, blood-drenched condom. Needless to say, we got out of there as fast as humanly possible, smashing our knees and shins against the sharp cement edges that lined the path to the ladder by which we had entered. Of course we were all praying that the manhole hadn't been resealed, as it was impossible to tell until you reached the ladder itself. Thankfully the exit route was clear, and we promptly dashed as far away as our legs could carry us. I'm sure this ending comes as a disappointment to some, as we never bumped into the twisted individual who sits in that chair. The reason I mentioned the population earlier was with purpose. There is easily enough people here to escape the realms of crazy country folk, yet nowhere near enough people to have someone clearly lose grip on society without somebody taking notice. For example, there was literally only one homeless man who everyone in the area knew and grew fond of, eventually resulting in a mass gathering at his funeral when he passed away. I sometimes think, though not recently, as I had more or less forgotten about that night entirely, about the person who climbs down into that bridge and navigates through the darkness to sit facing a wall and do God knows what that ends up with a condom full of blood. You honestly couldn't envision a more surreal situation. It has just come to my realization that what we unearthed that night has not once been uttered to another soul. As a naive teenager, it was the type of thing you just wanted to forget. But thinking about it, we probably should have let the police, or at least someone know, about what was down there, because it wasn't the doings of a healthy-minded individual. I am from a small town in Appalachia with a population of less than 7,000. There were about 80 people in my high school class, and people are generally very trusting. This story took place early last September, so it would have been a little less than a year ago. I was a 20-year-old male at the time, and had just entered my junior year of college about three hours from my hometown. In high school, I had a close cohort of friends. There were about eight of us that were very close. As things go, things changed when we went to our respective colleges. I felt out of touch with many of them, but I did retain contact with a couple of them. The ones featuring in this story are Mac and Devin. Last September, I got a call from my mother telling me the news. Devin's father had been killed in an accident on his way to work. It was a sudden but brutal collision involving a semi. Devin's family was not from the area. They had moved to my hometown during high school because her father had gotten a job there. Having no family and a dispersed set of friends, she didn't have many people to lean on during this time. Mac contacted me and wanted to know whether I planned on attending the funeral, which had been planned for Friday morning. I had an important class Friday afternoon, but I told him that I would come up that evening and we could occupy Devon. Mac made the six-hour drive from his college to attend the funeral. 
and I made it into town later that evening. We decided the three of us would spend a few hours at Mac's house. We were just going to hang out, and Mac and I were determined to preoccupy Devin. I got there around 6 o'clock, and we jumped right into it. We talked about college, we watched Netflix, and we played board games. Despite the circumstances, it was a pretty good night. I got up to leave about a half an hour after midnight. After some tearful goodbyes, I got in my car. Now for a little geography, Mac's house is a little more than a mile from my parents' house. There are no red lights and one stop sign. At the time of night, I could make the trip in less than two minutes. Being in a rural part of Appalachia though, the roads were far from straight. In fact, Mac's house was just off of a winding two-lane road. There were several blind curves that stop you from seeing what's coming ahead, and there are no guardrails or streetlights to speak of. So, I start off on what I thought would be a brief, uneventful journey home. I pull out of his driveway and start on my way. I drive into the first blind curve and am greeted by something entirely unexpected. I see the car first. It is a white, older model sedan. It is half in my lane and half in a culvert. I have to quickly swerve to avoid hitting it, and I notice a figure waving his arms as I slam on the brakes. I end up stopping on the side of the road. There is no shoulder, so my car is sitting in the road, and the grass is about 100 feet past his car. At this point, I should have kept going and called the police for help when I got home. But this is not what I did. I avoided that feeling in my gut, put my car in park, and opened my door. I stepped outside and immediately noticed the damage to the vehicle. The front end had serious damage. There were no other cars around. So I conclude the driver must have collided with the cliffside on the other side of the road. It is really dark though, so I have a hard time figuring out what happened. By the red light emitted from my taillights, I see the figure approaching me. Hey buddy, I need some help. What happened? Is there someone you'd like me to call? No, I, I tried to call my brother, but he didn't answer. He just lives up the road. Oh, do you want me to call the police? No, you can't call the police. I just need my car pulled out of there. He points into the culvert. I need someone with a truck. My brother has one. He's walking closer to me, and I am beginning to make out some of his features. He is a little bit shorter than me, but he easily has 75 pounds on me. At this point, the little light left me unable to discern much else, except that he was wearing a baseball cap. Well, I don't have a truck, so I guess I can't help you. I was beginning to feel very uncomfortable. He kept approaching me, and there was something wrong in his voice. A flatness, like he was not emotional at all about the predicament he was in. I started to walk backwards towards my car door. Drive me to my brother's house, he lives just up the road. He points in the opposite direction of my home as he walks towards my passenger side. I have to get home, my family's expecting me. This is a lie. They all have been asleep for hours, and I was still at Mac's house for all they knew. It'll just take a minute. He lives just up the road. His house is only about a mile away. He keeps progressing. My heart is racing, but I am in a strange predicament. I want to get out of there, but there isn't an ideal way to do it. My car doors are unlocked, and he was getting very close to my car. Being as fast as possible, I couldn't get in and lock the doors before he opened the one on the other side. I certainly couldn't put it in drive and pull away before he put at least some of himself in my passenger seat. Seeing as how he was going to get in my car if he wanted to, I decided to go the cordial route. If this was going to happen, it was going to be on my terms. I knew this road. My sister's boyfriend lived there and I knew that it was less than a mile from where I currently sat. It was a one-lane road. Maybe he was telling the truth. Maybe I was about to do a good deed. Okay, get in. 
He sits down in my passenger seat about the time I make it into my driver's seat. Since the doors were open, my car's interior lights were on. This was the first good look that I had of him. He was older than me, probably in his late forties. He was dirty, very dirty. His hands were greasy, his shirt was full of holes, and there were literally flies congregating around him. My car instantly smelled like body odor and bodily fluids, if you catch my drift. I experienced immediate regret. This was a horrible idea. My parents had taught me about this. My mother was a true crime junkie, and she would always warn about situations just like this. He closes his door, and the lights go out. I make a U-turn and start heading towards the road, and he insists on talking to me, although I would have much preferred the hum of the radio. He asks me my name. He asks me where I live. He asks me what I do. I evade every question I deemed too personal, for I did not want him knowing too much about me. I begin to get the distinct feeling that something is wrong with him. He speaks void of emotion or any kind of inflection. Sometimes he has a hard time getting the words out. I conclude he is either on a mind-altering substance or he is playing with less than a full deck of cards. We are turning on the road when he begins admiring my car. It is a fairly nice foreign car that my parents bought for my 16th birthday. He is rubbing the dashboard with his greasy hand before he starts pressing buttons both on the car and deep in my psyche. This is a nice car. A really nice car. I would kill to have a car like this. I kid you not, he literally said he would kill for my car. I didn't immediately take it as a threat, as there was absolutely no emotion in the statement, and it was a common turn of phrase. Nevertheless, I was getting very uncomfortable. My sister's boyfriend's house is just barely in sight. I am so worked up that I decide I am going to stop there. I'm pretty sure I could get a few beats in on his door before this guy attacks me for not taking him to his brother's place. As I approach his driveway, my heart sinks. There are no cars there, and there isn't a garage. No one was home. I am on my own. As we pass the driveway, he says something that catches me off guard. His house is about a mile up ahead. I thought his house was a mile from your car. No, it's a mile from here. Okay. I keep driving, but look at my odometer. I'm giving him one mile. That's it. We drive in silence, for which I'm grateful. He's still fondling my dashboard, but I figure I can ignore that. We go about three quarters of a mile further up this desolate road when I ask him how much further. I think he can tell that I'm getting irritated and maybe a bit scared. Just up that way, turn right. I stop in the middle of the abandoned road. He is pointing to a gravel road on my right. It is barely wide enough for my car, and it shoots steeply up the mountain. He lives a mile up that road, go that way. There was no way I was about to drive further into this desolate place when it seemed as if he was making up the directions as we went. There was no sign of life up there, and we had already gone further than he had originally said. No, that's as far as we go, I say to him. Get out. No, come on, man. We're almost there. Just turn up that way. I look around, and I have limited options when it comes to a weapon. In fact, I have one option. The previous winter had been a bad one, so I kept a brush-ice scraper combo in my floorboard. It was plastic but decently heavy. The scraper part had a sharp edge. I casually pick it up and sit it in my lap. No, get out. He was very reluctant. My makeshift weapon and the fact that I was literally in the driver's seat caused him to swing his door open. The lights instantly came on and he turned to look at me squarely in the face. He was grinning 
and his teeth looked as if he hadn't seen a dentist since before I was born. Please. This was the first time anything he said had any inflection at all. He said it as if he was trying to sound pitiful. No, I said sternly, and he began to get out of the car. He was in the process of closing the door when he said one more thing. He leaned into the open door and said, I really like your car. He slammed the door and I took off. It was a one-lane road, so I couldn't immediately go the direction that I needed to. I went up a couple hundred feet and turned around in someone's driveway. When I approach where I left him, I see that he has made no progress up this gravel road. In fact, it doesn't look like he moved at all. I slow down when I get close to him. I don't want to risk this man jumping in front of me or something. He stares at me as I pass, and I floor it. As I drive away, I can barely make out that he has started to walk. Not up the mountain, not further up that road, but toward the way that I was going toward the main road. The wrecked car was still there when I drove by, and I went straight home and laid in my bed, too terrified to sleep. I don't know what he had planned, but I am pretty sure I wasn't driving him to his brother's house. What you are about to hear is real. The events happened, and I still to this day don't understand it, and do not expect you to either. Theories and possible explanations are hugely welcomed. I work in a well-known clothing retail store in the UK, and I work in the stock room as part of the delivery stock team. About two or three weeks before Christmas 2014, I had asked my store manager if I could work some overtime to get more money for Christmas presents, and she thought this was a smart move as my stockroom manager was out of the country on holiday for a week visiting family also. Nearing to Christmas, the deliveries get pretty big, almost three times the size of regular deliveries, so there was the work available for me to come in and complete. It would involve stripping clothes from packets and hanging them within the stockroom. My manager had asked that rather than come in on a day I don't usually work, that I should instead stay for additional hours, past my contracted ones, which meant that I had to lock up. My manager trusted me to do this, as I've worked there for almost three years now, so she handed me her master key. The only other master key was with my stockroom manager, who was currently out of the country. This is where it begins. The time was nearing 8 p.m. at night. All of my colleagues had left the building, and I had locked the door after them, turned off the store music, and secured the bottom loading bay, where the deliveries come in. I was in the stockroom on the second floor putting some hangers on the racking so that I could use them for the next delivery. I was standing underneath a puppy teddy bear that was stuffed between a pipe and a wooden piece of racking facing me. The teddy was an old toy from a delivery that was left behind, and my colleagues had given it a name. A name I can't remember, because the teddy isn't really spoken of much. It just sits there. My iPod was plugged into a pair of speakers that had been in the stockroom since ever, and I was happily completing my task. Until I heard a noise. Yes, that might sound cliche, but this noise was very familiar and it was the noise of the bottom loading bay shutters being opened. I thought someone must be in the store, as the only way to open and shut them is from a panel next to them, from the inside. So I paused my music and proceeded to walk down the stairs, out back to the bottom loading bay. When I was about halfway down, the noise suddenly stopped. What I can say that always creeps me out about the place is that the lighting around the corridors, staircases, and stock rooms were lit up by strip lights, and these strip lights had sensors on them. So whenever you walked under, you would hear a small click, and it would come on. 
So there I was gliding down the stairs. Click, click, click. I burst into the loading bay, expecting to see one of my colleagues, but lo and behold, it was empty. The shutters were shut. I embraced a tingle down my spine and simply spun around and paced back to my workstation in the stockroom. I illuminated the strip lights and continued to hang some more hangers, the music from my iPod playing along, calming my nerves. Until I remembered, I turned my iPod off. I spun around horrified and just stared at my iPod over on the shelf. As I took a breath and shook my head, I caught a glimpse, a glimpse of where the teddy should have been sitting. I was drenched with panic and took a step back to look further down the stockroom, about a 100 yard stretch where I had suspected a culprit had fled, only to face darkness. I stood for a moment, still bewildered by what had just unfolded, when I heard a faint click. I instantly moved to my right to get a good look down the stockroom, but yet, I still faced darkness. Click, 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 was all I heard, gradually getting louder, closer. This is when Pavlov's theory kicked in, and I realized, no lights were switching on in sync with the click. No light switched on at all. I turned to the door to see my only exit route, and then spun my head around back to be greeted with a dark figure in the distance. The figure was big, what I can only describe as perhaps a male bodybuilder. I need glasses for long distance things and usually only wear them in the cinema or at football games. Anyway, the darkness didn't help. Within his hand, I could see a small object, although when the hand clutched at it, I could make out that this was the teddy. This is when I felt adrenaline scream. Run. Out of the stockroom, down the corridor, through two doors, and to my right, straight into the ladies' bathroom, opposite the two offices, I ran straight into one of the four cubicles, the middle one, and locked myself in. I crouched on the toilet, shaking, partly because I'm a tall guy, and partly because my heart was hammering in my ears, putting my balance off. The doors of the toilet took a while to close slowly, as they should and I listened for anybody to be approaching. The doors shut closed, which gave me little relief, and I stopped and blinked, thinking for a moment. I wiped the sweat off my brow with my left forearm. As my head turned to meet my arm, I glanced down at the bottom of the cubicle. A face was there. A face was pulling away from underneath, just as I caught a glimpse of the mouth and the nose. My only description is that the teeth were black and seemed slightly bloody, and by the grayish skin tone and wrinkles, the person was old. I was injected with pure fear when I screamed, screw off, and kicked at the door, making it shake and slam, echoing around the walls in a thunderous noise. I swung the door open, looked back, took a deep, took a deep breath, and braced myself before darting out of the bathroom into the front of the store. I was charging along, preparing to attack anything to save myself from injury, yet nothing stood between me and the front door. I unlocked it with shaking hands and ran outside. I knew I would left my coat and iPod inside, but I was eager to get out. Locking the sliding doors behind me, I spun to the shutter lock on the wall. It's located at the bottom of the wall, and for this reason, I am unsure of, as it's always been a hassle for people. I turned the key inside the lock, and the shutters were descending. The store shutters were on the inside of the store, just past the alarms, and as I crouched there, slowly watching the shutters come down, again, I witnessed the figure still holding the teddy in the middle of the shop floor. It was dark outside, and it was dark inside at this point. The shop floor lights are different and have to be switched on in the office. I closed my eyes and begged the shutter to hurry as it hit the floor and I snatched the key away and ran down the road to the high street. 
My phone was in my pocket where it's always kept, so I called the police and told them what happened. I told them I believed a person had broken in. The police arrived shortly after, and I let them into the store. I had them escort me to the office to turn the lights on, and as I reached the office, I noticed the computer was on. I told them this wasn't on before, but they sped me up to turn the lights on so that they could search the store. After touring them around the store to search, even the lift, they found nobody and told me to go home. The officers said that they would contact my manager tomorrow. The next day, I arrived at work at opening time, even though I wasn't scheduled to work. I was greeted by different officers from the night before and my store manager. We proceeded to go to the office just after my manager had opened the store and let my colleagues set up. The officers had said that they would continue a search that day and night again and that my manager should ask for CCTV to be installed. I walked to the stockroom to get my iPod and coat before leaving when one last stab of fear yanked my heart to my boots when I glared at the teddy stuffed back into its usual space. I was allowed two contracted days off that week to rest. I think my manager thought I was seeing things and needed to sort myself out. I returned to work as usual. I was happy to do so as it was within the daytime and the store was full with people. Nothing has happened since. I still don't know how it was possible or what happened. If it was a prank, if someone or people had a motive. Some people think I'm crazy. Some think that it might have been a group of people. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fallout Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my dad's clients, who was a lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for this one family who had a little girl that was nine and a little boy that was seven. The parents seemed okay, if a tad bit crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy, given I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at that age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play murder. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard the term on TV knew the word was shocking and said it just for a reaction, but I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering, wide-eyed, and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on TV because their parents did not seem like the type to allow their precious seven and nine-year-old to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, Oh, that's fine. We'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to stay out here. I knew exactly where that was headed. I said they could watch any other TV show in the living room while I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I had even got out the bread, I hear a massive crash. Completely shocked and pissed, but ultimately with no way to punish her, I cleaned it up while these two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes and smiles. Dumping the broken glass of the vase they broke in the trash, I went back to making the sandwiches. I'm a vegetarian, so while these kids had chicken, I had made myself a simple salad. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless. I ran over to the couch in the living room, living room to check on my ankle, he howled, dramatically flopping into the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, 
the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind. I was focused on the little boy, pretending to be in pain. He kept saying, I went to stand, but it hurt too much, over and over, until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. He was miraculously healed. Yeah, right. At this point, I was just thinking that these kids were really weird, craved attention a little too much, and probably needed more parental involvement. Whatever, I was 13, and that $60 was only four hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two kids to eat at the dining room table, went to get all of us soda, and then returned. After pouring soda for the both of them, I realized they hadn't even taken a bite of their sandwiches yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. They smiled. For you to take a bite of yours. I am so glad I had the gut feeling to, li to lift up the top piece of bread on my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw broken glass. Broken glass that I had put in the trash earlier. I stared in horror at the two little kids staring at me with menacing grins. I lost it, shouting, Are you serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What's wrong with you two? Instead of crying or apologizing or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two kids began laughing. Not like kids. It was too low. It was low and threatening. I will never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was, these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister who was 17 at the time, crying about what had happened, and she came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of premeditation that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich and the totally remorseless way they responded to my getting upset. They were unlike any two kids I have ever met before or since. This memory I've tried to block out, but the other day when my siblings and I were talking about funny stuff my dad did when he was alive, and how humorously absent-minded he was as a parent, this long-forgotten memory came back to me, and I can't stop thinking about it. When I was four years old, I had a playground fall that resulted in a serious cut to the back of my head that needed stitches. A few weeks later, my dad took me back to the doctors to have them removed. I was very brave and sat very still for the doctor. So as a reward, my dad got me an ice cream and took me to the beach for a paddle. It was a very small Australian town and the beach was quite secluded. Even though it was the middle of summer, there was only a handful of slightly older children swimming, mind you, without their parents. My dad walked me down to the water's edge and warned me sternly to stay in the shallow water and not to go in any deeper than my knees. Then he disappeared. I imagined to use the public restroom or something. I know that looks bad, but he wasn't a bad father. As I mentioned before, he could just be a bit irresponsible and absent-minded at times. It drove my mom insane. There was an older boy about 10 years old or possibly a little older. He was paddling around a few meters away, but slowly came in closer, leaving the other children. Then he called out to me. I remember he had blonde hair and was smiling. He asked me what my name and my age was. I answered, also filling him in on all the important details about my trip to the doctors that morning, emphasizing that I had been very brave to impress him. My story seemed to amuse him, and he asked why I didn't come out and swim a little deeper. 
I explained that I wasn't allowed in past my knees until my dad came back because I couldn't swim very well yet and would get into trouble. He assured me that I couldn't possibly get into trouble if he was teaching me how to swim, and besides, my dad wouldn't see because he wasn't there. When I was still hesitant, he added, Are you scared? I thought you were brave. So I followed him out until my feet couldn't touch the bottom, and he immediately grabbed me and pushed me under the water. I am getting angry and upset just thinking about it. I struggled, but he was more than twice my size. I realize now that he had taken me out willingly so that the other kids wouldn't know what he was up to. Drowning an unattended young child really is the perfect crime because you could very easily pass it off as an accident. Probably only moments before I lost consciousness, the boy abruptly let go and my dad lifted me out of the water. I can still see the look of bewilderment mixed with fear and rage on my dad's face. Then, for what seemed like a very long time, he patted my back while I screamed, sobbed, and coughed over his shoulder. By the time I had settled and my father was satisfied that I was okay, the boy and the other kids were long gone, although my dad still went driving around looking for them. Had that kid stuck around, I'm quite certain my dad would have killed him. When I was young, from the ages of 2 to 10, I lived on a 7-acre ranch. There was a small house in the front of the property where we lived, a huge grass yard, a cabinet shop behind it, and an orchard in the very back full of walnut trees. My father was a carpenter that always worked in the shop, and my mother was a school teacher that was almost always busy. Because of their jobs, and the fact that they were new to parenting, as I got older, they really didn't pay as much attention as they should to where I would wander off. I would spend my days roaming around the yard, playing in the dirt, and running through the walnut trees. I obviously didn't question my lack of supervision, as it was fun to explore this huge plot of land, and I just thought I was being a normal kid. When I was about seven years old, my father surprised me with a brand new, child-sized ATV. It wasn't one of the electric ones that you are probably picturing either. It was a really fast, gas-powered quad. Now, now, at this point, a good amount of you are probably questioning why someone would give a gas-powered ATV to a seven-year-old child. But like I said, my parents were a bit reckless, and they, well, my dad, just wanted me to have fun. Pretty much right after I got it, I learned how to ride it by myself and started going farther into the property and past it than I ever had before. I now had a free ride to basically go as far as my young self wanted before turning back. I started riding through the orchards behind my house almost every day and I loved it more than anything. I would leave my house and be gone for hours. After a while, I gradually started roaming farther and farther away from my house as I became more brazen and a little older. I would ride down this dirt path that led past what I assumed was our neighbor's land and to a ditch that held water. At the time, I just liked looking at the water as it flowed and I felt like I was a little explorer. I honestly never contemplated that what I was doing could be the least bit dangerous and I really don't think my parents knew how far I was riding. When I think back on it now, just the idea of riding a pretty dangerous piece of equipment far away from my house, without my parents knowing where I was, and before cell phones existed, is pretty scary in itself, as I could have crashed or hit my head, and no one would have been able to find me. So, one day, like every other day, I was riding far away from home, and I passed by a man wearing a dirty white shirt, denim jeans, and a wicker farmer's hat. I remember it vividly as it was the first person that I had seen in all the time I had been out there. I remember the surprised look in his eyes as he stared at me while I rode past him. 
I had no reason to stop, and my parents had always taught me about stranger danger, so I kept going and forgot about it. On the way back home, a couple hours later, I was coming up to the same spot, and it dawned on me that this is where I had seen the man. I looked ahead, not expecting him to be there. As I said, it had been hours later. Yet as the trees parted, there he was. I really didn't think it was too weird, because I figured that he was a farmer, so I kept driving, coming closer to where he was. He seemed friendly, to be honest. He had a big smile on his face, like he was happy to see me. To my ten-year-old self, I just thought he was a friendly guy, so I waved at him as I passed by, and he waved back. I continued on my way and drove home not thinking much about it. I don't really remember how much time had passed between then and the next time I went riding, but it couldn't have been more than a couple of days. Like usual, I took the same dirt road, passed the same few orchards to the same ditch that was full of water. I didn't think much about my previous encounter, so I hadn't been thinking about the stranger with the big smile. I was sitting on the edge of the ditch when I heard footsteps in the dirt coming up from behind me. Again, I remember this vividly because it was not a common occurrence to see anyone on this trail. I remember being more curious than scared and turned around to see the same stranger with the smile. This time, his smile seemed to be more of a toothy grin. He called out to me as he walked up, asking what my name was in a heavy southern drawl. I told him with confidence that I wasn't really allowed to talk to strangers, to which he said, That's a good idea, although you really shouldn't be out here all by yourself. It can be dangerous for a kid your age. I remember this striking me in the gut with a little bit of a butterfly feeling. I wasn't afraid, but I felt uneasy. This piqued my curiosity, however, as I wondered what he meant. So I asked him. He continued to walk closer to me slowly and answered. I heard they found a little boy out here, just around your age. I think it was that ditch right there where he drowned. I would like to point out here that although my parents were reckless, they were not stupid. If there had been a drowning near our house that was reported, or there had been a story in the paper, they definitely wouldn't have let me come here anymore. Why don't you come with me, and I'll take you back to your parents. It's not safe out here for a kid your age. Uh, it's okay. I have my quad right there. I'll just ride back. I pointed over to the side of him where my quad was, but he didn't look. His eyes remained fixed on me. They were dark brown, almost black, and piercing into me. At this point, I was scared, and I knew that this could be a bad situation. I was hoping that he was just a concerned old man, but there was no way that I was going with him anywhere. I got to my feet to start walking to my quad, to which the man said, Should a kid your age be riding something that dangerous? Let's just put it in my truck, and I'll give you a ride back. I don't see a truck, I said, looking around, hoping to talk my way out of the situation. Oh, it's right over there, on my property. You can't see it from here, he said, his smile widening. It's really okay, I'll just go now, I said, starting again to walk to my quad. But as I passed him, he reached out and grabbed my arm. You really shouldn't be out here, he said, staring me deep in the eyes. It's not safe for little kids. Let me go, you're hurting me, I shouted, starting to panic, but this only made him grip tighter. Maybe you don't deserve to go back home. What kind of parents would let their kid be out here all alone? Maybe you should come home with me, and I'll take care of you. At this point, I was about to pee my pants. I was freaking out, and I started to scream. I don't know if I was saying anything. I just know I was screaming as loud as I ever had before. This only seemed to anger him, 
as his once toothy grin turned to a face of anger. He put his hand over my face and I took this opportunity to bite his finger as hard as I could. I still remember the taste of his blood, so I know I hurt him pretty bad. Thankfully, this caught him off guard as he finally let me go. I knew this was my one chance to get away, so I booked it to my quad as he winced in pain. Get back here, he cried in anger. I knew I didn't have much time, so I jumped on my quad and turned the key as fast as I could. It started up, and just as I pulled the gas handle, I felt a hand start to grab my neck. Luckily, he didn't have a grip yet, as I was already starting to drive away. I punched it, and sped, and sped away. At this point, all I could hear was the sound of my quad, so I wasn't sure if he was running after me, but I wasn't going to look, as I could possibly crash if I did. I drove down that dirt path as fast as the quad would go, probably the fastest that I had ever driven it. When I got home, I peeled out into the dirt and ran into my house, hoping that my mom was home. I burst into her room, bawling, and there she was. She asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't talk yet, as I was so afraid. I just kept crying. I think I cried for a good 30 minutes before I could summon up the strength to stop and tell her what happened. I remember the fear in her eyes as I described what happened. She pulled me close to her and hugged me as hard as she ever had. The next day, I talked to a police officer and recounted the story of what transpired. I honestly don't remember much after this, as I think I started to block it out. It's not really something a ten-year-old wants to think about. Needless to say, they never let me off the property again. My dad started drinking, and we lost the house soon after this anyway, so I didn't have to live there much longer. Recently, I was thinking about that day after I started trying to remember various parts of my childhood. My parents had never told me what happened after the cops were called, and I had never really asked, because I tried not to think about it. So yesterday, I went to her house and asked her if they ever found the guy, considering he had to live pretty close to our property. She was kind of startled by the question, because we hadn't talked about it in 15 years. She paused for a minute, as if pondering whether to tell me, and then said, We didn't have any neighbors out that way. It was all corporate-owned land, and the description you gave didn't match any of the neighbors in the other direction. We called the cops and they went to search where you told us you were, but the guy was long gone by the time they got out there. They looked around the property and found an abandoned house that hadn't been used in years since the land was purchased. When they looked inside, they could tell that he had been staying there. Apparently, he left his stuff behind. We never told you this because you were way too young, but one of the things they found was a black grocery bag. It had a roll of duct tape inside and a hunting knife. Uh, thanks, Mom. But did I really need to know that? My freshman year of college was one of the funnest years of my life, and some of my fondest memories are from that year. But it was also the scariest and strangest year to date, and I'm 31 now. This is thanks to one story in particular that takes place over the entire school year. I still sometimes wonder how this really happened, and I didn't end up a nut job, and it still freaks me out to this day. I've only talked about it once or twice since it happened 13 years ago. August 2001. Like most freshmen, I live in the dorms at a state party school. I opted out of the good school that I got into. I guess I had a little steam to blow off after graduating from a military school. Plus, after a sports injury, I didn't exactly have any specific plan for life that went past Saturday night if you know what I mean. A good buddy from military school, Bill, 
went to the same college and lived a few floors below in the same dorm as me. So of course, we were getting the party started before my parents' exhaust fumes had even evaporated from the parking lot. For the most part, the first month or so of college was pretty much normal. I went to most of my classes, partied just about every night, chased girls around, and that was enough for the moment. But things began to change one night sometime in mid-September, and college for me would never be normal again. My dorm phone rings in the middle of the night. Hello? On the other end, I can only really describe the voice as the kind you would picture when you think about a computer talking, kind of like the early model car GPSs. Hi Gary, how are you today? Not fully awake, I'm just confused at this point. Uh, who is this? He repeats. Hi Gary, how are you today? It becomes clear that I'm being messed with, so I hang up and chuckle. Bill, nice one. And then I pass back out in my bed. I end up forgetting about the call for a few days, and never mentioned it to Bill or anyone else. About a week later, I get another call around the same time of night. Hi Gary, I am watching you. Oh nice, very cliche. Seriously Bill, how are you not knee deep in Everclear by now? Enough already, I'm starting to get pissed. I hang up the phone. I casually confront my oh so clever amigo at breakfast the next morning, purposely not trying to bite too hard to give him a payoff that might incentivize continued calls. I also wasn't 100% sure that it actually was him and not another one of my friends. He gives a genuinely confused response. Whatever. So a couple days after the second call, I come home and see that I have multiple messages on my answering machine. What the heck? I barely knew that that thing even worked. It was the computer voice guy. Message number one. My machine cuts off within one to two seconds of the message, which tells me it's a bot. Hi Gary, I am watching you. Message number two. I thought I asked you to answer my calls, Gary. Message number three. Where might Gary be on a Tuesday night? Okay, so one of my friends is messed up enough or bored enough to really push for a reaction here. The next day, I play the messages for Cade, our other roommate, who was around during the calls, which were apparently earlier in the night when he was still awake. He had been a close buddy since we were in junior high, but we had sort of taken separate paths after high school. So anyway, he's aware that I'm a wild child, and thinks nothing of the first couple messages. By the third message, he is a little spooked. I then walk down to a couple other buddies' rooms, and casually, but immediately bring up the subject. Nothing. Over the next couple of days, I press all close and semi-close friends, but get zero answers and zero suspects. The calls start coming more frequently over the next couple months, starting at once a week, then to once every two to three days, up to every day by Christmas break. I don't say anything to my family at that point, although I really, really should have. What started out as a decent beginning of college turned into not showing up for any classes, tests, nothing. My grades reflect and I am too busy answering for a .67 GPA to talk about some dumb prank that would likely be dismissed as a pathetic attempt at grades explanation. So it goes. Uneventful break and back to school, determined to become a new man. I have to get it together with these grades, so I tell Bill that I'm gonna have to chill out and focus on school. My first night back, I get my first spring semester phone call. How is your family in Cyprus? Which is my hometown suburb. Okay, this is not funny anymore. What kind of jerks am I hanging out with that even have the discipline 
to drag out a prank this long? I get the answer to that question a few days later, and the answer is none of them. The calls become threatening and downright dark. I'm very interested, Gary, in being close to you. Yeah, with kind of the weird sentence structure like that. I have tools I can bring. It is going to all be over soon. One day, I bring Bill and all my other friends up to hear the messages. I never deleted a single one for some reason. I guess when things happen over longer periods of time, you don't really feel the cumulative impact until laying out the complete package of evidence. The guys are in shock. I guess I should mention that some of these calls got really specific in making sure to note specific details about my parents' address as well as the violence they are planning on doing to me. Cut open your esophagus, Gary, with a butter knife. And all sorts of other crap like that that is sort of blurred together through hundreds upon hundreds of calls that I received over the school year. A female friend of mine that I had really liked in high school named Layla goes to a different school hundreds of miles away. We have reconnected thanks to good old AIM, which was AOL Instant Messenger, and talked from time to time on the phone. The creepy electronic voice that left me messages had mentioned a couple of times, your friend, and made threats about this unspecified person from time to time. But, your friend, turned into, your friend Layla. Layla and I are the only two people ever named in these calls, but it did get me wondering if this was a new lead to the source. Layla is clueless when I call her about it. One night, we're all partying and drinking at some hotel. A different buddy of mine, named Carl, has a nice big truck that we would all go everywhere in, but he had passed out drunk at the hotel after pounding an entire bottle of whatever. I'm not really drinking tonight and want to get back to my own bed. I snatch Carl's keys to drive back to campus, thinking that I'll drive back to the hotel in the morning to get everyone. This was one of the few times I had even driven that year, so I wasn't tip-top on my directions. I make an early turn and am somehow down a road that I have never seen. I realized this pretty quick but I figure I've got the general direction of campus pegged, so I can just continue the wrong road until hitting the familiar highway that I knew I would eventually have to hit. I'm finding myself in open fields, still a paved road, but aside from the road, there was absolutely nothing, and it was completely black. Around 3 o'clock a.m., I came to this really strange four-way stop. Strange, because I'm probably the fourth person in a year to drive on that road. I trudge along, eventually get to the familiar highway, and home free. A few days later, the creepy voice guy interrupts his usual depraved threatening to mention that specific four-way, the day and time that I was on it, which, like I said, was around 3 o'clock in the morning, and there wasn't a soul in sight. So yeah, I now realize that this person that's been leaving messages is obviously tracking my movements. I never mentioned it to anyone, and to this day, I have no idea how this person knew where I was in the middle of these roads. Around March, this apparent rendezvous became the creepy voice guy's focal point, and he would make sure to let me know that this day was close. The calls were coming in no fewer than 10 or 15 times every single day. Seriously. The ringer was now off out of courtesy to my other roommate, Cade, and I turned down the volume of the answering machine as his phone calls recorded. But I finally get the message I had been waiting for. Keep in mind, I have now become somewhat famous, or infamous I guess, at this university because of the creepy voice guy. People were constantly knocking on my front door, wanting to hear the messages. Friend of a friend or whoever, I was all people wanted to hear about at parties. Blah blah blah, 
For a split second it was getting cool, because I'm pretty sure I ended up getting a few dates indirectly from introductions conceived through interest in the creepy voice guy. Don't judge me. Moving right along, the day, time, location are set. We will meet in front of Coleman Hall at midnight Wednesday, 27 April, and we will take our friendship to the next level. I know what you're thinking, and yeah, throughout the year I had considered the possibility that I was dealing with a female. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and I was definitely that kind of guy when I was 18 or 19 years old. The kind that could attract clinginess and anger. But, I started to rule out female for various reasons that only a fellow would understand. I can build profiles with a very high ratio of accuracy to available information. This creep just didn't feel like a female to me. It didn't even feel like a peer. I was convinced I was dealing with a mid-thirties white male computer nerd that I had come into contact with at some point in my life. It doesn't really matter, because what I ended up finding out on April 27th, the Wednesday, which by the way, was Layla's birthday, I was wrong. Of course, everyone wants to be a part of this juicy story, and there's a pretty ridiculous amount of testosterone floating around the dorm on game day. This was a real life creep and a legit horror story unfolding before their very eyes, and groupthink will subvert caution if properly motivated. These guys are ready to defend me with their lives. Just ask them. So while these guys are getting all hopped up on Mountain Dew, I stay home that afternoon, wondering what I was going to do at midnight. Of course I was going to go, but man, yeah. I've always been an athlete in good shape. Wrestling, football, baseball, yada yada. But I'm still a 19 year old male. Good parents, grew up in middle upper class suburbia, and had a good life. In other words, I can definitely hold my own in a street fight. But this, whatever this is, doesn't feel anything like a street fight or any other kind of fight I had ever been in. This is a disturbed, violent, angry, possibly psychopath that, that has decided to dedicate almost a full year now of his life to targeting and terrorizing me. So yeah, I'm a little freaking nervous. My home team crowd steadily built up throughout the afternoon and evening, with probably close to 70 or 80 guys grouped up at our dorm's common area smoking cigarettes and hanging out. Once the party hour approaches, though, over half of the guys splinter off into other various propositions that probably included more traditional fun, like beer bongs and sorority girls. I'm left with about a 15-20 member platoon. I had decided earlier that I was not going to allow all these knuckleheads to shadow me but I, could, but I could definitely use them in case of emergency. I didn't want to risk him spooking out of the meat, so I let them know that they will need to stay inside the doors of the common area while I walk out to the meeting spot. Coleman Hall was adjacent to our connected girls' dorm and about 300 paces outside door to door to get to Coleman. The witching hour finally came, so I leave my crew to begin the longest couple hundred or so paces of my life. My boys can see me through the glass doors, but wouldn't really be able to see me much once I got to the Coleman Hall door. About 100 paces out from my spot, I observe two things at the same time. One, some kind of small quick movement in front of the patio walkway that goes all the way around the building, and two, the movement was in a spot along the walkway where the only normally uber-bright bulb is out. I'm not exactly sure how I was able to see him, but I suddenly realize someone is crouched behind one of the cookie-cutter bushes outside the patio perimeter against one of the building pillars, in dark clothes and a hoodie, 
He is a few feet off from the path where I'm supposed to meet him, and positioned to where I really should not have been able to see him, given the pillar blocking any shadow plus the burnt out light. In fact, I could have easily walked all the way to the door without ever having noticed someone down there. Nope. I sort of jump mid-step as this happens, and I see him raise up a little, thinking that I might have seen him. I see him raise up and take a step toward me, and that's when fight or flight hits me. I've learned that my particular fight or flight chooses fight in more mild situations, flight during intense situations, but for moments like this, where I feel that my life could genuinely be in danger, it's scarier to run away with your back to whatever scary crap that I'm dealing with. So I fight. Before I realize what I'm doing, I'm in a dead sprint towards this guy who I'm guessing sees what I can't yet, which is my platoon busting through the glass doors in pursuit. The creep immediately starts running away, running on the patio alongside Coleman Hall toward the parking lot. I can tell that this isn't the mid-30s computer nerd that I predicted. This guy is above average height and above average build athletically. That's all I could tell, really. I'm really booking it as he right turns on a dime at the edge of the building. I realize I'm moving fast enough to catch him, but everyone else is really far behind. I also realize that I'm moving so fast I won't be protected as I turn hard right at the corner of the building. If he stops there, I'm toast. As I turn the corner, I see the van sitting alone in the parking lot in front of me. It's running and brake lights flicker on and then off, park into drive, and begins inching forward towards the exit. The guy of course is heading for the van, which for some reason sent this whole new level of fear into me. This is it. This is really happening, and I am going to get murdered tonight. But I can't stop. Something keeps me moving forward. I guess I had come this far, dealt with this crazy bullcrap for almost a full year now, completely unable to do anything other than try to ignore it. I'm not exactly going places academically at this point and my life doesn't quite have all that much purpose to it yet. If I'm going to be killed, I will at least know, and this crap will at least be over. Plus, I still have a chance to catch this madman before he gets away. If I could get close enough to dive tackle, I would still be on my own to deal with this creep. His driver, and now I realize, there's a third guy that was manning the sliding door. Awesome. I don't care how bad you think you are when you're a 19-year-old jock, your chances of taking down three grown men that are already violent criminals and prepared to victimize are about one and not going to freaking happen. My turn is wide and slow due to me being in a full-on sprint, and I lose ground. I'm probably 20 yards from the lot when he does a flying leap into the side of the van. There couldn't have been any rows of seats for a leap like that. The creep slams the sliding door shut as the van peels out of the parking lot, hangs a right, and is gone in an instant. The relief of not being kidnapped, bound, and gagged in the van with three psychos who most likely had some pretty horrific plans for me is now just as strong as the dread of the fact that this is still not over. I was speechless, and so was my platoon as they catch up a minute later. A few of them caught up enough to witness the parking lot scene, but no one was talking. Testosterone has now been replaced with genuine and earnest concern. They all just stood there with me, catching their breath and making sure I was alright. One guy asks if anyone got a plate number. Not even I did. Not enough light. We finally start walking back, and I'm reliving the scene as we retrace our steps. As we get closer to the original meeting spot, I see something that scares me more than anything else in the entire equation has up to this point. 
On the opposite side of the pillar where the creepy guy was crouching, there's a video camera sitting on a stand, pointed right at the spot I would have been standing when I should not have been able to notice him. And it was still recording. I'm retelling this story on behalf of my departed grandmother. Truth oftentimes is stranger than fiction, and this story has been passed down through our family for years. It serves as a reminder that you can never be too careful. I don't know the exact year, but this took place during the 1950s when my grandmother was in her 20s and living in a very rural area of Kansas. At this time, she had already given birth to my mother. However, she claimed to be stepping out on my grandfather with another woman. I have no idea if that's actually true, but I don't see why she would lie. On one stormy night, my grandmother left my mother with my great-grandmother and drove out to her girlfriend's house. According to her, the two of them had planned to get drunk and listen to some records. She arrived at the dark farmhouse in the pouring rain and knocked on the front door, but did not get a response. Back then, when plans changed, you mostly didn't find out until it was too late. You couldn't send a text message or even call whenever you wanted. Figuring that something had happened, my grandmother decided to spend the night in the empty house anyway so she didn't have to drive back in the pouring rain and began searching for the spare key. She went around to the back of the house, the wind tearing at her coat and nearly knocking her over. She reached the back porch and continued her search for the spare key. Apparently, it wasn't in its normal spot, so she sat on the somewhat sheltered back porch behind a pile of firewood. She said her being too stubborn to go back home was what likely saved her life that night. She lit up a cigarette and sat smoking for an uncertain amount of time. She didn't want to break into her girlfriend's place, but she also didn't want to go back out in the rain and return to her car and drive back in these conditions, which had only gotten worse. She stated that lightning was crisscrossing all around the sky, and the wind was making the wooden fence lean at a sharp angle. She then saw a light come on from inside the house. It wasn't the light of a lamp or anything. It was a beam of light that flashed quickly. Figuring that her friend had returned home, she stood and pressed her face to the window. She didn't knock or call out, because she figured that the noise of the storm would just drown her out, so she just waited to be spotted by the window. The flashlight had disappeared into the other room, and after another moment, she caught sight of a man she didn't know, moving around way too slowly to be someone that knew the layout of the house. She only got a quick glimpse of him in the darkness, but she saw enough to know that it wasn't a member of the girlfriend's family. She thought it could have been a neighbor that she didn't know, but his suspicious behavior was making her uneasy so she ducked down and decided to wait a while, despite the raging storm. After a while of hiding, she crouched beneath the window and would occasionally see the flashlight beam dance across the back porch from one of the inside windows. She figured if it was someone who was supposed to be there, they would have either turned on a light, or at the very least, would have stopped wandering around so slowly as if they were looking for something. After what she suspects was a few minutes, the door to the back porch opened, and the stranger stepped outside and shined the light across the length of the porch, including the woodpile, which, fortunately, prevented her from being seen. She stayed hidden, and after another brief sweep with the flashlight, the person went back inside. The stranger could have easily found her, had he decided to take a look around, but she figured he doubted anyone would be hiding out there, given how rough the weather was. She heard the door slam again, and the stranger disappeared back inside the house. She peeked in through the window and watched as the man went upstairs. She waited in apprehension until he came back down to the ground floor, still carefully shining the flashlight around. He eventually wandered over to the front of the house, and then she heard the front door slam shut. Afraid that he may walk around the perimeter of the house and find her, she emerged from her hiding place and opened the back door, which was now unlocked. She carefully made her way inside and locked the door behind her. Without turning on any lights, she ran to the front door and locked it too before looking out to the front yard. She didn't spot the intruder anywhere. Shivering, she locked herself in the downstairs bathroom and covered herself up with towels. 
She was very aware that the man would potentially still be in the house, or could even have his own key to gain access. After she dried herself off, she risked a quick run up the stairs and locked herself in her friend's bedroom. She had tried the light in the bedroom for a split second just to see if the power was out, which it wasn't. She then lay down on the bed. Exhausted, she nearly drifted off when a blinding flash came from outside, followed by a loud, thunderous cracking. It jolted her for a moment, but rational thought prevailed. One of the old trees out front must have been struck by lightning. She then fell asleep. The following day, she got up and searched the house in the daylight. There were no signs of her girlfriend or her family anywhere. She called her mother and then the police. An officer arrived a short while later, and she explained everything that happened the night before. Still unable to get a hold of her friend, the officer acknowledged that it may have been someone with permission to be in the house, but decided to take a look around anyway. After a while, he called to my grandmother. He asked my grandmother to describe what the stranger from the night before had been wearing, but she couldn't with any real certainty, as it had been too dark. Apparently, a body was discovered in the tall grass of the front yard. My grandmother's girlfriend returned home after the body had been removed from the property. She had been stranded several towns over the night before because of the road being washed out by the storm. The corpse was a man who had been an older friend of the family, but someone who most definitely did not have permission to be in their house, alone. As predicted, what had killed him had been a bolt of lightning that struck him down in the front yard. The man was carrying a six-inch hunting knife in his hand, which had likely been what attracted the strike. It was suspected that the man came looking for my grandmother's friend, as she had rejected his advances in the past. But when he spotted the strange car in the driveway, he decided to enter the house cautiously and find out who was visiting. This is all just a theory, but the family stressed this man would have never been allowed access to the house by himself, and they had nothing of his that he might have been looking for. My grandmother thinks that the timing of him leaving the house and the lightning strike was off. She said it was roughly a half hour window between her entering the house, locking up and drying off, before hearing the lightning strike. She doesn't think he was still in the process of leaving. She suspects he was on his way back. When I was 24 years old, I experienced something so strange, so scary, that I just had to write about it and share it with the world. It is absolutely true and was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. I was traveling at the time, going to visit my best friend, who had moved a few states away from me to go to college. I was driving in Ohio, if I remember correctly. I was on a long highway that stretched across the state, when out of nowhere, my car died. I shifted to the side of the road, where I eventually came to a stop. I didn't run out of gas, I had just filled up at the last town. I tried starting my car, and I was very happy when it actually started. I was confused and was worried about why it just died on me. As I started to pick up speed and get back on track, my car started making weird noises and it sounded like something was grinding on something else. I looked up and saw a sign that showed that there was a gas station and food at the next exit. My car was moving, but with this grinding noise, I decided to get off the highway and take a look at it at the next gas station. There were only two places off this exit that I could see. A gas station with one pump and an old looking diner not too far off next to it. I pulled into the gas station and it looked closed. I checked my watch and quickly realized that this was very strange considering it was 2.30 p.m. What kind of gas station closes before this time, I wondered. I got out of my car and approached the glass door entrance to the station. I put my hands up and cupped the glass around my eyes to see inside. The place looked abandoned. It was obvious nobody was there. And I turned and looked around me. I felt a bit uneasy at this moment when I saw that no other people or cars were around. 
What the heck? Where am I? I checked my phone and of course, I had no service. I looked up at the sky and it was white. The clouds were moving fiercely and it was extremely cold outside. I decided to get back in my car and drive it over to the diner nearby. When I reached the place, I thought for sure it was closed as well. But to my surprise, before I could even reach the door after getting out of my car, an older woman opened the door to the diner and greeted me with a smile. She looked nice, and I was so relieved to see someone else and maybe get some hot food in my stomach. She said hello and asked if it was just me and if I wanted a booth. Blah, blah, blah. I told her yes, it was only me, and a booth sounded great. This diner looked very old-fashioned, and there was no other customers inside. The woman showed me to my seat, and I scooted into the booth. I looked up at her, and she was wearing an old apron with stains all over it. Her teeth were old, yellow, and cracked. She had a pleasant voice, though, and seemed to be a very nice person. She handed me a menu and asked what I would like to drink. I told her a Coke or a Pepsi would be great, and she smiled and said that she would be right back. I sat there looking at this menu, and there was dirt on it. It looked like it had been sitting outside for years. I cleaned it off, and, and the food that was available on it was very basic. Burger, chicken sandwich, fries, and a salad, and that was pretty much it. I decided to order the burger with fries. A few minutes passed, and the woman hadn't returned with my drink yet. I was anxious to ask her if there was a mechanic around to look at my car. A few more minutes passed, and I started thinking, what is going on back there? I yelled out, uh, hello, in as nice a voice I could manage. No response came. At this point, I was annoyed and got up. I walked over to the door that led into the back cooking area and swung it open, about to ask where my drink was. The back of the diner was empty. There were no cooks, no fryers, no grills, nothing. The woman was nowhere in sight. It was obvious that this diner was not a running establishment, and I felt sick to my stomach. I started to walk into the back area when I heard the scariest, most evil old lady laugh I've ever heard. I stopped and backed up out the door into the front. I turned and walked out the door I came in from. I ran down the three steps over to my car and got inside. Thankfully, my car started immediately and I floored it out of there. As I was driving away, I looked into my rearview mirror and saw the woman standing in the middle of the road. I took in a puppy a few months ago. Her original owners weren't able to bond with her, said that she was unresponsive and disobedient and didn't have the look that they wanted. I have no idea what they were talking about. She's the best behaved dog I have ever known, and she's downright adorable, so I'm used to people stopping me in the street so they can pet her. Usually people will ask before they touch her, or at the very least, they'll say something like, Oh, look at that dog, to let me know that they're obviously going to come over and say hi to her. I'm pretty much fine with that. What I'm not fine with is what happened on one of my earlier walks with her. I live in a tiny seaside town, one of those places where the location is beautiful, and I like to take my dog on a tour of all the areas closest to the sea when I walk her. We'll walk along the beach, down the promenade, around the miniature lakes, and then home. Probably not smart to stick to the same route every day, but I've switched things up since then. We were at the final stage of our walk, making a couple laps around the lakes, when we walked past a man. Now a lot of old men gather there on a regular basis, 
I didn't think much of one guy sitting on a bench by the water. I told myself that he was staring, because my dog was cute. I just passed him by. Then, from behind me, I hear him say, Sit. And my dog, who is much more obedient than her previous owners let on, sits down and looks up at me all happy and expecting a treat. I look back at the guy and frown, and I see that he is still on the bench and quickly encourage my puppy to start walking again. We haven't even gotten five feet further down the path before the man says again, Sit! And my dog does. I turn around again, already glaring, and see that the man is now on his feet. I tell my dog to keep walking and pick up the pace, trying to, trying to get over to the path that leads up to the main street. We're still nowhere near the path when the man yells, Sit! And my dog does. She's starting to look confused, and I'm pretty much terrified. He's now walking towards us, and he's catching up fairly quickly. He's close enough that even without my glasses, I can tell that he's grinning. At that point, I had had enough. I forgot about getting to the path. I just scooped up my dog off the ground, ran straight up the hill to the side of us, and climbed over the little fence that separates the lakes from the street. The man didn't follow, but stayed at the bottom of the hill, looking up at us, not smiling anymore. I had never seen him before, and haven't seen him since and I hope it stays that way. I don't know exactly what his intentions were, but it seemed to me like he was using my dog's obedience to slow me down, to keep me from getting away from him, so I doubt they were good. Glad I didn't stick around to find out. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainer. Like, not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I wake up and hear something. Open my tent and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him. Just a guy. He saw me open my tent. His eyes got huge, like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day, I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well, after writing it off as just some odd occurrence, and a guy that was probably high or something, and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as on accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness someone said, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no. I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that away. And, kind of spooked, and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer. So I shined my light that way again, and it was the same guy who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days, because there is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as this wilderness is. No possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, 
so I stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off because the only way he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was over first thing in the morning and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice I heard what sounded like a person walking circles around my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided it sounded much more like a human making animal calls, but could have actually been an animal, but I didn't actually see the guy again. But it really sounded like a person making howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were and no way of ever getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time, she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't super close by. We lived out in the country, and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town, about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day. While we were there, I noticed an older man tall, skinny, that looked ill, and that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles, and I said sorry, and since then, I had seen him like five times, and every time, I felt a shudder, and I would look around, and he would be somewhere, staring at me. I told my mom, and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later, we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well-known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle, and she was on the other. I ended up finding it, and reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. I could feel his breath on my face. He said something like, You're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. And I freaked. I pushed past him and ran back over to my mom and said, Found it. Let's go. And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers, and unfortunately, we had a lot of groceries, and the old man got in line next to us, and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him, and was relieved when he exited the store. But unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store, I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car, and got behind us as we went to leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay, and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said, we were about an hour away from home, and the back roads made it even longer. We were about five to ten minutes away from home, and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said no, 
Call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with the shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbors were about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway to where you couldn't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway, and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their shotguns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. I had already memorized the license plate number and told my dad after we got home. He called and gave the plate number to the cops. I don't know what came of it after that. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around my house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just gotten off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 o'clock yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9 something at night, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in, a spare bedroom, and, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever it was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. I was so thankful he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had some boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone was hiding, it would be it would be in the bed because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. 
From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away, and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put into a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain that I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all of the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were laying all over the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened, and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell, though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often use to smoke meth so they think that he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected the evidence and told me I should stay with my friends or family that night and to get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil. But I didn't see anything. The next day, I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet, and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved. Except now, I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting into the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. First off, let me preface. This is a completely true story that happened to me in the summer of 2009. Some of what I did, or my reasoning for what I did, is a little hazy because this was 11 years ago but the events are all true. I was 18 years old, I'm a male, and it was my final year in high school. I was optimistic for the future, but truth be told, I was also lonely. I had never been kissed. Blame it on having a disability. Don't get me wrong, I had gone on dates with girls, but I was also friend-zoned. So I decided enough was enough 
and I was going to finally be with a girl, even if I had to pay for it. Blame it on my raging hormones. Since I lived in a town of 10,000 people, there were obviously no escorts there, or at least any I knew of. So I took to Craigslist and went on to the adult services section of a neighboring city in a different state. This was a year before the U.S. federal government forced Craigslist to shut down their adult section. As I scrolled through the adult ads of beautiful women and their salacious posts, a gorgeous brunette caught my eye. I texted her, and through a series of texts, we set up a meetup. Since my car was verging on near death, the escort offered to drive the hour to my town. We planned it for a day that my parents would be out of town. The day finally arrived. I was a mix of emotions. Nervous, anxious, lascivious. A black Jetta pulled up into my driveway, and I nervously swallowed hard, ready to have my first intimate experience. When I opened my front door to meet her, I was met with a girl who looked nothing like the escort ad. I was catfished. She wasn't ugly or anything, she just didn't look like the pictures and wasn't exactly somebody I wanted to pay $300 to. There was a moment of awkwardness as I struggled to speak, caught off guard by this catfisher. Hey baby, can I come in? She questioned as she, as she inched her way forward. Oh, uh, sure, I nervously said as I let her into my house. I was filled with panic. I had no idea what to do. I began to brainstorm for a solution, but couldn't think of anything. So where's your room? She asked as she looked around my home. Oh, it's downstairs, I muttered. We went downstairs to my room, and I had no idea what to do. I finally got up the courage to speak. Hey, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm not feeling it. I can give you gas money for your troubles, but... I tried explaining as politely as possible, but she cut me off. No, baby, we agreed on 300, she said firmly. I understand, but I'm... I once again tried explaining, but she once again interjected. I'm not going anywhere until I get that 300, she stated in a matter-of-fact tone. I was at a loss for words. I felt like I was a prisoner in my home and felt like I was under duress. I had no way of getting her peacefully out. I could not drag her out as I was so nervous that she would use this meetup against me and obviously she would press assault charges against me if I forcibly removed her. It would not be a good way to start my senior year. Then an idea popped into my head. I would lure her out of my house and then lock her out. I would pretend to drive to the bank and have her follow me and then I would lose her, go back to my home and lock her out and she would get the hint that I wasn't interested. Okay, I said as I began to reiterate out loud the plan from my head. I can give it to you. The thing is, it's in my bank. That was actually true, because I had planned for this incident to happen. If I was going to be catfished, I would only give her $50 for gas, as that would be all I had on me. If she was the actual girl, I would have gone down to my bank to get the money out. This was when smartphones were only just becoming popular, and I only had one of those easily breakable flip phones, so I didn't have an app to send money to her. She fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. We got into our individual cars and began to drive to my bank. The way my hometown is situated is that there is a main highway that runs through the town which connects to the freeway. As we got close to where the bank was, I hurried and turned right onto the freeway on-ramp. I began to laugh out loud, thinking that I would lose her. To my absolute horror, I looked into my rearview mirror and she was pursuing me. She really wanted that $300. I hit the gas pedal and went up to 80 miles per hour. She easily followed along. I was so scared, 
mostly because my 1995 Pontiac was so old that I was afraid it would fall apart at that speed. I began to motion with my hand for her to go away, but she kept following me. I looked at my gas tank monitor, and I was fine with gas, but I didn't know how much longer she would follow me, and I didn't want to drive to the next town, which was 30 minutes away. So I turned off onto an exit, trying to turn around, and insanely, she still followed me. Deciding that this was going to go nowhere, I decided that I would try reasoning with her outside the bank, which was inside the local Walmart. We pulled into the Walmart parking lot, and I got out to talk to her, and she boxed me in by parking in front of my car so that I couldn't get out. Cut it out. I want my money, she firmly stated. I was a scared 18-year-old. I didn't know what to do, so I gave in. I was tired of trying to evade her. I felt incredibly stupid for the mess I had got myself in, so I decided to just comply. I went into the bank, looking like I was in a, you have 10 minutes to get the money or your family will die situation. I should have gotten help. I should have told the teller what was going on, but I was so scared. I came back out and I gave her the money. She begrudgingly said thanks and then drove off. I was sad because I wanted intimacy and for an 18 year old high school kid, 300 is a lot of money. So does the story end here? Nope. Later that night, my dog began barking. I went upstairs to check on my beautiful golden lab to see what he was barking at. I patted his head and then went to the window that oversaw my driveway and saw that there was a black car idling. My heart sank. Was it her? I couldn't tell, and I didn't want to know. I went to my kitchen, retrieved a knife, got my dog, and went down to my room and closed the door. I was so scared of what I had done that calling the police frightened me. I sat up all night waiting for a window to be smashed in and for me to ward off intruders but nothing happened. The next morning, I examined my home, and there was no damage. No black car was in my driveway either. I breathed a sigh of relief, ready to put this behind me. I decided after that day that I would never use Craigslist again to find an escort, which was a short-lived promise. I tried retelling my experience shortly after to my friends, but nobody believed me and I sure as heck wasn't going to tell my parents. So does the story end here? Nope. A few months later, my family and I went to the neighboring city to watch a movie in a nice theater. The theater was located in a nice outdoor mall. As we were strolling along, a lady began shouting across the street. I turned to see what the commotion was, and to my horror, it was the escort she was standing with another young woman, and she was yelling incoherent things in my direction. I instantly put my head down, trying to ignore her. I was so afraid that she was going to recreate that one scene in the movie The Ringer, when Johnny Knoxville pretends to be mentally challenged, and he's with his quote-unquote caretaker, and then his high school acquaintance run runs up to him, saying hi. I gritted my teeth and was saying under my breath, Please no, please no, please no. Is she yelling at us? My mom remarked. No idea, I replied. To my relief, the woman didn't follow us, probably because I didn't have $300 on me. For those of you who may think that this is all just a fabricated event, I asked my brother the other day if he remembered the woman yelling at us at the mall. He said that he vaguely remembered... I told him what I just told you. So now you're wondering, did, did you ever see that woman again? Not in person, no. But, four years later, there was a woman featured on the news who had gone to a man's house as an escort, and when he felt hesitant to give her money, she ransacked his home and had her male friends come over and threaten him. It was her. My heart sank, and I felt sick, 
as it dawned on me that that could have been me. So many questions filled my mind. Was that why there was a black car in my driveway that night? Why did they not come attack me as well? Or was it just some random car who decided to pull into my driveway? I will never know, and I'm glad I didn't find out. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning, and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We would only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We would build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we would find cool bridges to fish from and a camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we would likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We, ha we had a lot of... We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun, we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch, and always tried to coordinate visits so that we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we would either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came. We started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off at our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we'd take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, and we had a map, so I said, yeah, let's do it, and off we went. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days, too. We would walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we would be fine. But when we got to the top... We saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it, either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. 
We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews, and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point, it was dusk, and we just decided to rig up our hammocks, go to sleep, and move, and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like... people singing. And it did sound like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so that you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in a foreign language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears, and then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the train tracks. Once there, 
We ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices, and they did not sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. My uncle went to a rural college. The campus was in the middle of a town of about 10,000 people. Most were college students or worked at the college, but there were some locals. He moved off campus his junior year and lived about three miles outside town and the bar districts. After having quite a few beers with his friends, he decided he better walk home since he had an exam that morning. As he was walking down the country road, with cornfields on either side, a man in a truck pulled up, who appeared to be a friendly farmer. He offered to give my uncle a lift to save him the walk. My uncle, being drunk and not thinking straight, took him up on his offer. He got in the front seat, and they took off. He gave the man directions to the house he lived in with his college buddies, and then about five minutes into the drive, noticed that the man had gone past the turn that he needed to take. He informed the man that his house was behind them and that he needed to turn around. But the old farmer man said that he had lived in this town for 50 years and knew a shortcut that he would teach him. That's when my uncle began to get suspicious. He started asking questions and surveying his situation. The farmer obviously had a final destination as he continued down the road, and then eventually pulled into an old driveway with a very old barn that was falling apart. My uncle said the roof was half caved in. My uncle's plan was to bolt the second the man slowed down. So when the farmer slowed down and parked, my uncle pushed the unlock latch and gave the door a shove. The lock had been sawed off and only part of it popped up. At this point, he knew he was in for it. The driveway was made of gravel, and there was a very old playground set in the front yard, and was completely rusted and falling apart. There was also a shed in the back of the property, behind the barn, that he said had lights on, but the rest of the property was dark and only illuminated by the headlights of the truck and the moon. When my uncle was telling the story, he very abruptly ended it with, Then I fought him off and sprinted home. I don't think he wanted to admit it, but something obviously happened at that farm. Never accept rides from strangers. <laughs>